uh, now would be the stage to declare any financial or other relevant interests in respect to today's business. Again, I'll just repeat the previous interest uh, that I had declared in respect to the personal injury duty rate item, which will be discussed at uh, item four on the agenda. Any other members? Then we note that. <coughs> apologies. I have apologies from Emma Rogan. And Gemma is joining us through the Starleaf facility, and I'll ask the clerk if she can indicate if any members have delegated as per the appropriate standing order. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson, Linda Dillon, and Gemma Dolan has also delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson in the event that the Starleaf connection is lost. Okay, thank you. Item two is the draft minutes of the uh, meeting on the 26th of November. The relevant uh, papers are there for members in their pack, and if members are content that they're an accurate reflection, I sign them only. Members agreed? Agreed. A couple of matters arising. There's a response that's been received from the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Justice, Chris Phillip MP, to the committee's le uh, letter on the counter terrorism bill. That response outlines the position that was set out in correspondence provided by the department that was considered at the meeting last week. So it's there for members to note. Um, the other item is just the forward work program for December, and uh, it's in your meeting pack. Um, also, the minister is attending on the 15th of December, the Tuesday. And members were asked to forward any issue that they would like to raise with the minister, um, and that has been provided by some of the members. They'll be forwarded to the minister just in advance of that session to help uh, speed that meeting up. Um, of course, members are at liberty to raise other questions on the day. So item four is the proposals for a new legal framework for setting the personal injury discount rate. And I'm going to invite the officials to come in, just as they're taking their place. Uh, we will be having Peter May, the Permanent Secretary, and the Deputy Secretary of Civil Justice, uh, Lauren McAlpine, at the meeting. And that's at our request to provide additional information and clarity on a range of issues in relation to the proposals for the new legal framework for setting the personal discount rate, the decision of the Minister to excuse herself from the policy making process and also the decision not to change the personal of its time. So the relevant papers members for this session is pages 24 through to 167 of your meeting pack and the department has also provided a copy of the responses received from the finance and the government actuary uh, via its statutory consultation on the original proposal that was to change the current personal injury duty rate from 2.5% to minus 1.75%. And those can be found on pages 3 to 12 of your tabled pack. So let me uh, formally welcome Peter May, Permanent Secretary, and Lauren McAlpine, uh, Lorraine McAlpine uh, Deputy Director of the Civil Justice Policy Division from the Department. Of justice, you're both very welcome. Um, as normal, for this, the session will be reported by Hansart, a transcript of which will be published in due course. So, Peter, I'm going to hand over to you at this stage and to make some opening remarks, and then we will get into some questions. So, thank you, Peter. Thank you. So, thanks for the opportunity to provide some further clarity on a number of points in relation to the personal injury discount rate. The committee raised five points in its letter to the department, and I'm going to deal with each of these in turn. Firstly, you asked what we mean by the transparency and clarity offered by the Scottish model. Setting the discount rate involves working out what sort of return can be obtained on the lump sum. The Scottish model prescribes in the primary legislation the specific investments that are to be assumed. So, for example, 5% of the lump sum is assumed to be invested in property and 10% in index-linked gilts. This means that investments upon which the rate is based are transparent and clear to everyone. The Scottish model also prescribes in legislation the amount of any deductions which are to be made from the investment calculation. Under the England and Wales model, the specific investments and the amount of any deductions are left to the discretion of the Lord Chancellor, having taken the advice of an expert panel. Unlike the Scottish model, therefore, it is not clear on the face of the English legislation exactly how the rate is to be calculated, exactly what investments will be assumed, and the amount of any deductions that will be made. The second question was about why setting an interim rate would not address the ongoing uncertainty. That uncertainty exists because parties to litigation are anticipating a downward change to the current rate of 
It is therefore not in the interests of, it's not in the financial interests of claimants to settle <coughs> cases until the new rate has been reduced. By the same token, if we set a new rate based on today's interpretation of the Wells versus Wells judgment, that would mean a rate in the order of minus 1.75%. It would then not be in the financial interests of defendants to settle cases, as they will anticipate the rate increasing with the new legal framework. Setting an interim rate would not remove the uncertainty, since both parties would still be anticipating a further change once the legislation was in place. Uncertainty will only be ended when we have a stable rate under a new legislative framework. It's also worth saying that any new rate can only be set currently in accordance with the existing law, which is the Wells versus Wells judgment. We were concerned that it would not be sensible to introduce legislation to replace Wells versus Wells, as we don't believe it complies with the objective of securing 100% compensation, while at the same time fixing an interim rate which is based on that judgment. Third, you requested information and details on the options considered by the Department and how it arrived at the proposed way forward. We published our consultation paper in June with two suggested options, to adopt the model for England and Wales or the model for Scotland, but we also asked respondents to suggest other models. The majority of respondents, who mostly represented defendants, preferred England and Wales, but nevertheless we considered that the Scottish model would be preferable for the reasons I have noted and because we were not attracted to the notion of an expert panel. We felt that expert panel added complexity, cost and delay. We also felt that once the parameters are in place, setting the rate is properly an actuarial rather than a political exercise, and thus it, it was proper for it to be set by the government actuary. The fourth question was how the bill would impact on the miscellaneous provisions bill if it did not proceed by way of accelerated passage. I think it's worth saying first that the principal reason for seeking accelerated passage is to secure the quickest possible long-term resolution of this issue. That is to the benefit of all, part, part, all, all parties to cases. In addition, it was our assessment that the subject matter was capable of being scrutinised by the Assembly using accelerated procedure because it is tightly drawn and the principal policy objective of securing 100% compensation for those who have been adversely affected is not at issue. On the legislative programme itself, both I and my colleagues are clear that this is a decision for the Assembly. As you know, the Department has an ambitious legislative programme of five bills, four of which will be before the Committee at some time next spring. If the discount rate bill were not granted accelerated passage, we consider there would be a real risk that there would not be sufficient time for all four remaining bills to be considered at Committee stage and complete their passage through the Assembly, particularly if bills are considered sequentially by the Committee rather than concurrently. As the miscellaneous provisions bill will be the last of our bills to be introduced, and indeed by far the biggest of the bills with the widest variety of issues to be considered, it would therefore re likely require the longest time for scrutiny, and it would be the one most at risk if the committee or assembly did run out of time. Finally, you asked about the views of the Department of Finance and the Government Actuary on the proposal to change the rate under the existing framework to minus 1.75%. The Government Actuary was consent that based on the Wells versus Wells criteria, minus 1.75% would be an appropriate rate, but noted that this would mean a significantly different rate in Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK. The Government Actuary also noted that because of the movement in the financial markets, the rate could also, still based on Wells versus Wells, be minus 2%. In commenting on Wells versus Wells, the Government Actuary also noted that a personal injury claimant was unlikely to invest 100% of his or her award in index-linked guilt. The Department of Finance did not express a view on the actual rate, but commented that it hoped that within the parameters of our decision-making, we would act in a way that would prevent overcompensation. A copy of the response from both the Government Actuary and the Department of Finance to our consultation on setting a new rate under Wells versus Wells have now been provided to the committee. I'm very happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, Peter, um, for taking us through the brief overview. Um, I have quite a number of questions that I want to, to ask in respect of this particular issue. Um, if I can just, first of all, try and establish your role in this. When did the Minister declare an interest and um, recuse herself from taking the key policy decisions in respect of this matter? Um, she would... 
She declared an interest in, in the summer, yes, after yeah. the consultation and before the decision-making process commenced in terms of the way forward. So she didn't notify the department at the point in which she came into office that she had this relevant interest? I think it, it is one of those things that may not be immediately apparent that there is such a, such a conflict of interest um, because the subject matter of the department is wide and varied and it was only at the point when uh, the decision making came, uh, uh, came into view I think that it became clear that there was such a conflict. Because on the 10th of July there was a letter sent from the Minister to Sarah Ramsey QC uh, which relates to all of this matter in respect of the consultation on the legal framework and also the interim and it says here that when both replies have been received I will reflect on the views expressed and make a final decision and um, that's in respect of the government actuary and department of finance consideration of the proposed interim rate that was signed on the 10th of July by the minister Naomi Long. The minister was involved in approving the issue of the statutory consultation to GAD and the Department of Finance, she knew that process was underway and she also approved the issue of the consultation paper on the new legal framework, but she hasn't had any involvement in the decisions which emerged after those consultation responses came in. And that, that time frame is consistent with um, what we said in terms of August? Yes, yes but the, the, the interest was registered in August. The Minister was actively involved in the decision-making process in respect of this matter and was signing letters on the 10th of June, July, no less, mm, yeah, quite a number of months that she had been in office. So the, I, I'm trying to understand then at what point she declares an interest and now steps back from her departmental duty and, and transfers it to you. It's clearly not at the start of this process. Um, it's, uh, as we've said, it, it, it was in August that she recognised a conflict and we provided advice to her about how she might choose to handle that and that was the point, of, uh, it was after that that a decision was taken to recuse herself from decision making. All of the uh, work that she'd done up until that point was preliminary in the sense that it was uh, of a process nature designed to seek wider views uh, on uh, the, the key issues. It wasn't t t taking decisions on what the outcome should be. Okay, well, I'll just, it's there for the record when she declared the interest, it was in August, and before that she was actively involved in signing letters in terms of the decision-making process. She had a role, whether it's deemed a key policy decision role or whether it's deemed to be a mute point, nevertheless, she was involved. So. In terms of your role then, Peter, you, you got delegated authority then to take decisions um, in August. So, I don't know if it was August or actually September by the time the decision was reached. Uh, well, the know. consultation exercise ended about August, so it's that point, at that point it was apparent that decisions were going to have to be taken. Anyway, around August, September, yes. Uh, okay. Sure. So... Whenever you were given the authority to decide, was it your decision not to strike an interim rate and to then go down this route of a legislative vehicle for a new framework and that the rate then would be struck pending that process? So essentially, yes, there are two decisions that uh, I was asked to take. The first was uh, in relation to what the right approach to the... Um, the right model to secure uh, the policy objective. As I said in my introductory remarks, the policy objective of securing 100% compensation for those who have been affected is, I think, common ground for, for everybody. Um, so it, was, it is a question merely of how best to achieve that. Um, so that was the first decision in terms of um, whether to go with the English or the Scottish model or, or indeed some, some third uh, option. And the, the second decision was whether... Uh, in the interim, uh, it was appropriate to set a rate that would require secondary legislation and approval by the Assembly, um, uh, or not. Did you consult the Minister in terms of her views on your decision? No, I didn't. Was the Special Advisor involved in that process? No. So what is the, the role that the Minister is going to have in respect of 
how this is going to be handled by the department. If you can just spell out to me what role she will have and the role of her special advisor going forward on this key policy decision. The, well, the minister will um, now assume her normal role in the sense of presenting uh, the proposed legislation to the executive. Uh, if, if she decides to um, proceed with the accelerated procedure request to come before this committee and then to take the legislation through the Assembly in the normal way. And in terms of your engagement with the Minister as you seek to take decisions on these areas, is there a firewall that has been set up so that the Minister is entirely insulated from that and does that include her special advisor? Well, um, there's, there's, an, there's not a, a, a firewall as, as such, but if further decisions need to be taken, then they'll be taken on the same basis as they have been uh, hitherto. What precedent is there for a minister delegating authority to a permanent secretary for key policy decisions? Um, I'm, I'm not aware of a direct uh, analogue. Um, I... I have a recollection, for example, of, I think, in, White, in Westminster, uh, Whitehall, ministers may have recused themselves from decisions about, for example, procurements, where they may have a pecuniary interest, um, which is, I think, in some ways similar to this uh, situation. Um, but uh, I'm not aware of a direct analogue. So there's no example that you can point to for a Northern Ireland executive minister registering an interest and then recusing themselves from policy decision-making processes? Um, I'm not aware of any. So what advice was taken in terms of setting this precedent up? Because this is a precedent now that uh, other departments and ministers will look to. Um, as you might expect, I took legal advice uh, before uh, reaching uh, decisions about in, to ensure that this was a, an appropriate way to proceed. And where was the legal advice sought from the Departmental Solicitor's Office, the Attorney General, ex uh, external to that? Uh, from QC supported by the Departmental Solicitor's Office. So it was an external legal opinion that was sought, yes. supported by the Departmental Solicitor's Office. And do we know who that QC is? We do. Yes, it's Philip McAteer, he's Junior Crown Counsel. Okay. Um, are we able to have access to that legal opinion? Um, I think the normal practice is not to, not to share uh, legal advice uh, outside of government. Uh, so I, I wouldn't be in, uh, moving away from that normal practice. Although this is normal practices that the Minister takes these decisions, so it's without precedent, <coughs> it's highly irregular. And I think we would need to see the basis for that in terms it's, of legal. It's not without precedent in other contexts. I mean, if a judge in a court case had a financial interest in the outcome of the case which he was been asked to hear, then he would recuse himself from that case. Continue that analogy. Who would then hear the case? Another judge. Okay. So it wouldn't be the clerk to the, committee, the, the court, for example? It wouldn't be a civil servant? It would be another judge? Yes. Okay. So... Should that not have been the case in this? So, if this had happened um, in uh, in England, um, then legislation uh, places powers uh, in the hands of the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of State in that context uh, means any Secretary of State. So, yes, it would pass to another Secretary of State to take that decision. In Northern Ireland, the statute book is set up differently, where powers reside in departments. Occasionally, individual ministers are given uh, specific uh, decision-making powers, but most powers rest with departments. Um, and on that basis, it's not possible for a minister from another department to take a decision uh, in a case like this. I mean, the power to set the, the rate under the Damages Act rests specifically with the Department of Justice. So another minister would not be a minister for the Department of Justice and would have to be appointed Minister for the Department of Justice to have the legal power to prescribe the rate under the Damages Act. Yes, and as you highlight in a letter um, back in 2018 where you referenced that the Department holds the power, you continued in that letter which was sent to the Chairman of the Bar Council to say that under Article 4, 1 of the Department's Order 99, the functions of a Department shall at all times be exercised subject to the direction and control of the Minister. That response was being provided to justify why the department, when it could have taken this decision, 
uh, given the powers that were given to it by Westminster during a period of direct rule, uh, not to take the decision because you were holding back on the basis that it's for a minister because of that legislation? I think the key thing there is, the key distinction to make is that um, in recusing herself, uh, the minister uh, asked me to take these decisions, so I was acting under the direction and control of the minister in taking the decision. It is a different scenario where there is no minister in place. I've been in that place, uh, taking decisions and had them challenged uh, in court uh, on the basis that um, there was no authority to take decisions in the absence of a minister. Indeed. Um, in terms of access then to both the executive and assembly proceedings, will you be making direct representation then as the policy decision maker on this? Um, I don't have any in intention to do so at this stage. Um, the, as I said, the decisions taken are in a very narrow space. The key policy uh, objective here is to secure 100% compensation. This is about how best to achieve that. Uh, whether uh, it should be done by an actuary uh, or whether it should be done by a minister on the advice of a panel, essentially. Yeah, and the outworkings of this affects people's lives Indeed. and affects the insurance industry and the Department of Finance in terms of negligence claims and so on. So but, uh, the objective, I agree, is, is clear, but the outworkings of it will have huge ramifications. That's why it's a key policy area that needs to be considered, and you're now responsible for doing that. Under the standing <coughs> orders, you can't actually appear before the Assembly because you're prohibited from doing it. So it's going to be the Minister who has declared an interest and recused herself. Um, so she's going to have to speak on your behalf. Highly unusual. Um, in terms of the media, will you be doing media interviews to defend these policy decisions, or will it be left to the Minister who was on the radio today? Um. Well, we'll consider on a case-by-case -case basis any media inquiries that are received, but um, you know, officials don't normally do um, media unless there's a particular reason to do so. Uh, if, if there are, then that will be considered at the time. But in a democracy, we're expected to operate in a way that's open and accessible to the public, and media is one of them. The minister has recused herself from this, and if you replay the interview that was held this morning, um, it didn't sound like a recusal to me, as she sought to provide policy interpretation, justification, uh, and indeed indicated that you, know, you had been providing advice. Is it not the fact that you're not providing advice, you're actually taking the decision? Um, as I've explained, I've taken two specific decisions, um, and I've explained that the Minister will uh, take the legislation through the Assembly, assuming the Executive approves it. Okay. Um, can you just advise me then, in terms of the interim rate um, that could be struck, is there any legal impediment preventing you from approving the interim rate that has been consulted upon? And as you have confirmed, the Government Actuary Department has deemed to be an appropriate rate to, to strike. Um, there is nothing to prevent um, secondary legislation being brought before the Assembly to set a, an interim rate. So the Minister said this morning that uh, that couldn't be done and was categoric that it couldn't be done. So you're, you're stating clearly that there is no legal prohibition on you now with the authority as the key decision maker on this area from taking a decision to authorise the rate of minus 1.75 per cent which your department has consulted upon has received the advice from the Government Actuary Department that it is appropriate. You could take that decision. The, the point the Minister was Sorry, making... Sorry, Lorraine, just one second. You can take that decision, Peter. I think that, um, Chair, we should approach these discussions in a, uh, a sensible way. Um, and um, I don't think we should make it feel like an inquisition. So if Lorraine wishes to add something, I'm very happy to hear from her, and I'll then respond to anything further you may wish to with, say. With, with respect, Peter, I'm chairing the meeting. You're not chairing it. Um, so, well, you, that, you, you can, that may be so. You can, uh, defer, you can defer this to Lorraine if you wish. I'm quite happy for Lorraine to do that. The question was to you. The line of questioning was to you. But, but please feel free. But to I th the point I'm making, though, is that uh, you can make this feel as though uh, this is a, almost a, um, a legal proceeding where uh, you will answer the question that I've asked you, as it were. And I think that that's, I'm not clear that that's really uh, an appropriate way 
for us to try to work together. When we have, it seems to me, as I've tried to say throughout this process, a shared uh, uh, policy objective here, which is both to secure 100% compensation for those who are affected and to do so as quickly as it is possible to do. It is possible to set a rate on an interim basis. I've explained in my introductory remarks why I concluded that that was not the most appropriate way to proceed at this stage. It is something that I keep under review and I could, at some future point, need to take that decision again. Okay. Well, the record, I... the record will note that you could take this decision, which is contrary to what the Minister said this morning. Well, Can I just clarify that? The point the Minister was making this morning is that she could not just fix a rate equivalent to the English rate or the Scottish rate. We can only fix a rate based on Wales and Wales. So it's not that we can just fix an interim rate of our choosing. We are we're fixed with the, the Wales and Wales outcome, which is minus 1.75%. I think the suggestion this morning was that she might be able to pick some other rate, which is not possible. I'm not sure who made that suggestion, although it does draw out the point that I'm making. The Minister is no longer in charge of taking these decisions and yet is taking place, taking part in interviews and trying to outline policy around this. Um, nobody has suggested that the Minister should take the rate that is in place in Scotland or England, the rate that the Department has consulted upon. The Government Actuary has said is appropriate, minus 1.75%, and the Permanent Secretary, who has the power, has confirmed that that decision could be taken uh, and implemented uh, without the need to wait for legislation to come through that would provide for a new legal framework. In terms of the proposal for the new legislative framework that's based on the Scottish model, that's a minority position in terms of the consultation responses. The majority um, have actually indicated that they're opposed to it. So having uh, taken forward a minority position on the, the, the new legal framework, and the Minister has recused herself from the key policy decision-making process. How then could there be justification for accelerated process to bypass the committee scrutiny stage of this? <coughs> so, um, I mean, I think a number of different points are being joined together there. Um, so, uh, you're right that um, in the consultation responses, we received a, a range of responses, the majority of which um, preferred England and Wales, and those who, who responded in that category mostly represented defendants. Um, and I and we looked very carefully at the most appropriate uh, way to go forward, um, and I've explained the reasons that we came to the conclusion that we did. In terms of accelerated passage, um, it is the desire to be able to provide that long-term certainty uh, as quickly as possible to those who are affected here. Um, as you said, you were on the radio this morning with, I think, a constituent of yours who has been badly affected. Uh, I am, um, you'll understand, not able to talk about individual cases, but that shouldn't uh, under, uh, under, undermine the, the importance with which we view the need to resolve those uh, issues uh, for, for people like uh, that lady and, and many others. Um, and it is, that's the principal reason why uh, we, we have suggested accelerated passage would be appropriate. Uh, the number of issues at stake here uh, is small, um, and the legislation itself will be small, uh, technical in nature, and as I said, all targeted on achieving uh, a policy outcome that is not contentious. And actually, uh, I think it is it is, it is pretty much the case that whether you chose Scotland or the English or Welsh uh, model, either could uh, achieve the policy outcome that has been set. So uh, it was a finely balanced decision. Um, I'm not saying the England and Wales system is wrong. I'm only saying that there were reasons why we felt the Scottish one was preferable. The Scottish model also gives the legislature a much bigger say in the framework, the new legal framework. The English model leaves a lot more to the discretion of the department. Yeah, and that, that takes you into, I suppose, the policy content of what's being proposed. And, you know, as Peter, you've said, it was a finely balanced call as to which model to go down. But this committee would be 
sidestepped in terms of our ability to consider that? Um, we're coming before you now and have come before you at every stage, Chair. Um, there would, uh, of course, still be opportunities for the Assembly to amend the legislation at the various stages. I've explained this is, this is a matter for the Assembly to decide. Uh, we've made the proposal because of the belief that it will secure a quicker, more certain outcome for those who are affected, and we believe that that is in the public interest, for want of a better word. Okay, so in terms of it being quicker, the timeline for accelerated passage references one month for every stage. So if the department introduced this in January, it's still not intended to get royal assent until September, possibly in June, but you're going to have one month for introduction. You'll have a gap of one month then before you would have second stage, which by the way would be longer than what the committal reform so, first and second stage was, then another month and another month. Normal procedure for accelerated passage would be urgent legislation that gets put through within weeks, not a process that you intend to take four to five months over. So let me clarify um, that um, the, um, the dates that were provided previously, I think, were very conservative estimates. Um, they were based on a belief that um, there may need to be a little more time between the stages um, just to recognise you know, the scale and nature of assembly business that needs to be conducted. But it is not us that will drive the timetable of this legislation, it is the assembly. And were the assembly to wish to move more quickly, there would be no difficulty on our part in, in moving more quickly. It is certainly possible to pass... Uh, through accelerated passage on any reasonable basis, not on the sort of uh, the, the quickest rate possible, but it would be possible to pass within you know, a number of weeks and to have it get royal assent, uh, royal assent well before the summer, uh, if the, that was the will of the Assembly. Okay. Well, I know my views on accelerated passage in respect of this issue, but let me bring in other members and then I will um, come back on some of the issues. Linda? Thank you. Thank you. Peter and Lorraine, can I, 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 some of my questions have been answered, to, to be honest, um, and Lorraine has, has clarified the biggest one, because I wasn't 100% sure that there was no potential for setting any other interim rate, so that's, that's definitive, which is, is helpful, so thank you. Just in relation to, the, to an interim rate, and obviously, I mean, I know, I understand the reasons for the, the current interim rate not being ideal, and the potential implications for the, for the executive and for finance department. What's the greatest danger around it? And I'm asking that reason that for this reason, obviously defendants can choose not to settle as well. So they could choose just let's hang on. Yeah. So is the greatest danger potentially for those who have been injured not getting settlements when they need them? I think the I think the risk is at the moment it's in the it's in the financial interest of defend of, of the of the claimant not to settle because they can see a bigger rate. As you say, if you set a, a rate at the other extreme where it's likely to um, to move in uh, move, move upwards um, as a result of the legislation, then that would um, create an incentive the other way to defend it, especially, especially when the legislation is coming along. I mean, there are um, I wouldn't. Um, say this was the, the key deciding factor, but it's fair to note that it would take some effort and activity from within the department to pass the interim rate and to make that all ha happen in a sensible way. And that will be the same team that's working on the legislation, which would push the legislation uh, back a bit further. Um, and that's, as I said, that's not the critical factor, but it's one of the things that mean if you set an interim rate, it's likely to be longer before you have that certainty. You're then not really helping to resolve the issues, whereas if you move straight onto the legislation, get the legislation through, um, then that would be the quickest way of achieving that. We also believe that we could ask the, if, when the legislation was going through, we could ask the government actuary to begin work on what the right rate should be, because we can't assume it will either be the Scottish or the English rate, because they, each, at each review point, they look at the market forces and what would be needed to secure that 100% compensation. Um, and they could do that in parallel with the passing of the legislation, which would reduce the amount of time after the passage of the legislation before it could come into effect. I mean, I, I, I actually I share some of the, the chair's concerns just around those who, who are injured and, and them not getting 
what they are fully entitled to. So I, I am keen that this is dealt with in, in the best possible manner, and that's I suppose what I'm trying to get to the bottom of. If I could just it, maybe go ahead. assist as well. I mean, at the minute, the rate set under Wells and Wells mm -hmm. runs a risk of plaintiffs being undercompensated, which is why plaintiffs won't settle. If we change the rate under Wells and Wells, it runs the risk of plaintiffs being overcompensated, which is why defendants will not settle. So we need a new legal framework, which means that plaintiffs are neither under nor overcompensated, which is why we need a bill, and they were trying to get there as quickly as possible. If, it, if the secondary legislation had to happen um, for the interim rate, it would, it would drop, what, what, the rate would drop so much that it would run the risk of plaintiffs being overcompensated. Instead, at the moment, the risk is that they would be undercompensated. No, no I, I, and I, I understand the risk. I suppose what I'm saying is defendants just wouldn't settle and that would be it. But, yeah. So I was, just, I was trying to bottom out the, the interim stuff. The secondary legislation, what kind of time period... And again, excuse my ignorance around this right, because I, I, yeah. I just don't know. No, interim legislation could be brought forward reasonably quickly, um, as, yeah, as within a matter of weeks. Real negative um, resolution, but that will distract us then from progressing the, the primary legislation. Okay, and Chair, you might be able to give me some guidance in relation to this. If we were not to go for accelerated passage, um, how quickly could we do do it through with the, with the committee stage included and um, I'm just trying to find out, get all the information because at the minute I, I couldn't take a position in relation to any of this because I need the information. Well the time frame for committee scrutiny obviously would be up to the committee. To the committee. You know, standing orders, uh, you need an extension if you're going beyond a month, um, which, which we have done on other legislation so you could take two months, three months, six months. Um, but. That's notwithstanding, the starting point on this is a policy decision on the Scottish model. And I haven't reached a view on which is better, because I've some sympathy for the current English and Welsh model, which actually still gives more flexibility to ministerial control. Um, and there's, I have some sympathy with those that are arguing that it's a better way forward. That's my dilemma, that I, I'm yet to be convinced that actually what's being proposed is the best way forward. But in terms of committee scrutiny stage, it can be as long or as short as the committee wants it to be. Okay. Those are all my questions for now. Okay. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Um, I want to bring in Sinead Bradley. Thank you. Um, Chair, I suppose it is important to make comment on the process before anything. And I think it's unfortunate that we were getting caught up in that part of it because it does lose sight of what we should be talking about and thankfully we're getting to that as well um but it it is a mess you know the i the minister may be 100 percent accurate in her choice to step back from this but today and, and i was deliberating on that but today to learn over the radio waves and um, via the stephen nolan show detail on the minister's view when I couldn't hear it via committee is, to say the least, disappointing. And I, I don't know whether it was just a bad uh, judgment and error for her to be there, but I appreciate the officials being here to talk to what we should be talking about. So in terms of what I, what I would like to understand better, in terms of, I, I understand under the Wells versus Wells, the interim payment, the, the rate has to be at that minus 1.75. Has any consideration been given by the department to consider an interim payment that may not be to that full amount um, as a tool just to, to buy time? Because I see this as a case of um, time versus best practice. Has any thought been given to that? I'd appreciate thoughts on that. Okay. If I could just cover the two points you've made, um, please. The, the first in relation to um, the radio appearance this morning, I think uh, it would be worth observing that the Minister only went on that programme having heard that the Chair of the Committee and one of his constituents was going to be on the programme. So uh, she was responding 
to a request uh, to ensure that um, the position was set out from uh, a, a departmental perspective. The, the second point in relation to interim payments. Um, Sorry, on that. Sorry, no, I appreciate that. I do appreciate that. But I think given that, you know, it was put to us at the committee that the minister felt a need to step back from this. And I had accepted that. So for me then to hear the minister was the spokesperson on this issue from a departmental perspective and for me to hear it firsthand by the minister some very good points i have to say but i'm not i think she muddied the lines again you know that that clear thinking was presented at the outset and then her being on the program um giving personal and departmental views it has to be said and i don't want to i really don't want to give too much time to that i'd rather get um to the substantive work here yeah. but and i appreciate i don't expect you either to speak for her in that decision today because I, i'm not convinced it was a departmental decision that she would go on there no, so no, much no. as a person it's, it's clearly yeah any, any media appearance the minister does is a ministerial uh, for the minister to decide um so if i move on to your second point taking uh, what you say about focusing on the substance um the 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 the, the, the the parties to each individual case um, are, in most cases, um, not the department. So there will be somebody who has suffered uh, a damage of some description or another. Maybe let's take a medical damages case where they may be taking a case against a health trust or some other uh, public body, or it may be against a private individual um, uh, from a road traffic accident. And so um, what, as I understand it, um, is is possible, and, and Lorene can, can say more about this, is that any, anybody who um, has a claim, they can settle that either on the basis of a lump sum, um, and then this uh, question about what rate applies to that to make sure that the lump sum compensates them over the whole of their lifetime and takes account of any vagaries uh, of the, the financial markets. Or they could choose instead to take essentially an annual payment. And, and there's a phrase for that that has just escaped me. And I'm going to ask Lorraine to say a little more about that. Well, instead of the lump sum to cover their needs for their lifetime, they could take uh, a periodical payment, which would give them their annual need. So if someone lost a salary of 30,000 a year and had care needs of 70,000 a year, <coughs> 100,000 pounds a year for the rest of their life, Instead of taking that as a lump sum minus the statutory discount rate, they could just take a, an annual payment of 100,000 a year. It is also possible for parties to negotiate a settlement outside the prescribed statutory discount rate. I think there is a general recognition, even amongst um, insurer defendants, that 2.5% is on the high side. And I am hearing anecdotally that some cases are settling for less than that amount so parties might be able to negotiate a settlement it's not that they they are stuck with the two and a half percent okay thank you for that so but uh, what i'm trying to get at maybe i'm not explaining myself well here so for example we understand if you if you put the um dynamic in one way the defendant won't settle and if you go the other way and um, then the claimant won't settle and that's understandable but i'm just wondering is there scope in there in the middle and um, where we can put good legislative practice in place which may take a longer time so therefore we won't strike a more permanent and um, considered rate is there room in there for an interim payment to be made and what i mean there is that it's, it's not a conclusion or it's not a settlement but it's a bridging payment and so, there will be then so it could be at say and i'll, I'll put this at 70 percent and then there's a calculation when the permanent settlement it's not ideal but i'm only teasing out is it something that was ever considered for the pros and cons I think the short answer is there's no way that the department can require that to be the case of those who are parties to cases. It is, of course, open to parties to cases to arrive at any uh, arrangement they may choose to do, but you couldn't legislatively prescribe how that would work in such a way as to provide the sort of certainty <coughs> that you, I think, are, are looking for uh, in terms of ensuring that people don't, don't miss out, as it were, in the, in the intervening period. 
Okay, Peter. Thanks. Thanks. And I ask that question because ultimately what we are talking about, um, these are individuals who are waiting and dependent on a sum of money that they haven't got access to to improve their daily lives, you know, um, in a very fundamental way. And I just wondered if there was an earlier route of getting at least some of that money to them that would significantly change their lives straight away, you know, because I can see how we could get so caught up in the process and the technicalities um, that we're losing sight of. We need to get that money to those people as quickly as we can. Wholly, of course, we want to get it to them, but even partially, I just want to know if that could be explored. In terms of then, I noticed one of the um, statements that you made in, in indicating your preference, and I appreciate that that was a deviation from, I think it was only 28 respondents, to be fair. And um, you mentioned there as well about the length of time that the investment model, I think it was 30 something years, as opposed to the English model, which was more extensive. Are, are you suggesting that the department would consider extending the number of years that the investment, I know it's a notional investment model, but extending the number of years that that portfolio would be cons measured against? That the Scottish model is based on a, an investment period of 30 years, whereas the English uh, Lord Chancellor took a period of 43 years based on, I understand, average claimant's life expectancy. So there may be an argument for making that one adjustment to the Scottish model, but we're, we're taking advice from the Government Actuary Department on that. Okay, thank you, Chair, for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Peter, th listen, thank you very much. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a complicated issue. It is complicated, and uh, and whether we go for the England and Wales model or whether we look to the Scottish model, whether there's advice one way. Or, I mean, that that to me all has to all has to play out. And and my concern here, notwithstanding the complexities of of how we've got to where we are now and and the time lag, my my concern is understanding what the impact will this will be um, in all of the different governmental departments so for example if we change this to the to the, the to the English and, and Welsh model what will be the financial impact on say the health service so will it will it be a huge is, is there a bigger will the health service in fact uh, we, we won't know that we can't compare the outcome of the English and Wales model against the Scottish model until the government actually or the expert panel run the numbers. So what I think is clear is that whatever legislation is passed will, will mean significantly increased costs for defendants when they settle. Because the, at the moment the rate at 2.5% is everybody agrees some way out of line of what could be expected. We know that in both England and in Scotland, they've set rates slightly differently. They set them at slightly different points in time, and that's the point Lorene is making. The actuary would come and look at the particular point in time we set it, and then it would be set. It would be set for a period of five years, as I understand it, and then there would be a review, and that's true for all of these because you'll understand stock markets change over time and and so on. Um, if we were to move to the uh, Wells versus Wells interim rate then the impact would be still greater on defendants because if they chose to settle, because then obviously they're, they're moving still further away, uh, well, they're moving a good bit beyond where, uh, where we think the, the rate will likely end up. Um, but we can't quantify that for the reasons that... But the overall objective, though, as Peter said, is 100% compensation. Uh, and it's not an exact science, and I mean, it's demonstrated by the Scottish figure is slightly different from the England and Wales figure, and our figure may be slightly different again, depending on what the markets are doing when GAD comes to run the exercise. But it is everybody is trying to achieve 100% compensation. And, and I don't think anybody is against that. I think that's, yeah. that's laudable. I think we're, we're all with that, I, I, I guess. My, 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 my concern is, is still. My concern is always going to be those numbers. That, I mean, if, if we're saying significant increase in the amount that the health service will have to pay in compensation, that concerns me. Uh, and and so, the, so my concern of all of this is, notwithstanding all of the complexities, is how much scrutiny I want to give this, how much do I think it needs to get, and, and therefore what I'm really stuck with is, you know, if I want to really dig into this and understand it better, I don't 
want to give it accelerated passage, and that will have an effect in itself with some people who will then defer their claims until they 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 get a better rate, so to so to speak. I get that as well. But that's my dilemma: is that accelerated passage and, piece and becomes my my dilemma really? And and if I can, Peter, I, I mean, I know you can't run the numbers, but you see, for me, as a, to give me an idea, for example, if I took the 2019 whatever happened and what we paid out in compensation 2019, say for the Department of Health, and just run those numbers with the new figures and see what it would have been, I would at least understand what the increase would not saying it would be, but what could be. You mm -hmm. know, to see what that, is it, so, what that increase is going to be looking but, like. But ultimately, if it costs the Department of Health money, that is as a consequence of negligence, which has caused catastrophic injury to some individuals, and those people are entitled to their comp compensation. We've been quite careful that in setting or not setting a rate under Wells and Wells, yes. the, the cost to defendants isn't a consideration. I, and I just wanted to stress that point. In reaching the decision to, to proceed with either the Scotland or the England and Wales model, the outcome for the defendants can't be a factor in the decision making because the policy objective here is 100% compensation. And, and, and that's why I absolutely agree that there shouldn't be an outcome to the, to the defendants. Um, they get it all, but there's so, a real difference in what, in um, what the, the, the Department of Health would pay out in, so, compared to the England, Scotland, Wales, or the, or the you know, you, you know. But, but so perhaps I can offer two observations. Just would you like to get first? Three? Well, well, I was going to say it, when the England and Wales model is run again, maybe in five years, yeah. and the Scotland model is run again in five years, you might find that the England and Wales model costs defendants more, and the Scottish model not so much because. It, the England and Wales model depends more on the discretion of the Lord Chancellor, what the expert panel tells him. So there's no guarantee of how that's going to work out for defendants in the future. The England and Wales rate at the minute is, is lower than the Scottish rate because of the they, they went for 43 years instead of 30 years. Yeah. It was run at a different time. I think the portfolio of investments was slightly different. But that may all change again in the future. I think it would be wrong to assume England and Wales will mean um, a rate more favourable to defendants. I mean, that's the way it worked this time. We don't know what way it will work in the future, and it isn't really about getting a favourable rate for defendants. It's about getting what is the rate which gives the nearest to 100% compensation. Yeah, absolutely. Perhaps I could just add a couple of points. Um, so um, uh, it may be difficult to give you a run of numbers that concern the whole of the health service budget, but I think what we ought to be able to do is to see whether we could identify a sample case, Lorene, and use that to demonstrate the outcome for an individual based on different outcomes. I think that that uh, ought, ought to be possible. So let's see whether we could do something that would help to to make it real, as it were, in terms of, of the, the, the impact and the consequences. There was another point I had, which I'm afraid I've lost, but I will see if it comes back to me, I'll, yeah. I'll come to and if I can, uh, if I could just finish, Chair, if you have if I could just finish and, and just absolutely agree with you on something and make this absolutely plain and simple, as I want the, the, those who are entitled to the money to get that 100%. I'm absolutely with you on that. Uh, and you are living and breathing these numbers in many ways. You certainly are living and breathing these numbers. Um, but but I'm scrutinising them and I'm not. And that's my dilemma here today is all about whether or not I would support an accelerated passage or whether I need that time to scrutinise to get it 100% right. Because we don't know or we would not know what the impact could be on the likes of our health service in, in four or five years. That's, that's my concern. But, but uh, I've remembered the other point, and which may be helpful to you. And our understanding is, and we're looking into this in more detail, is that when, for example, in England and Wales, they made this change, uh, the, the Treasury did make some allocation to the budgets of those who were affected to recognise that there was a, an increase in the payments. So the obvious question is whether they would give us a similar allowance because we are making a similar change. Now, at this stage, I can't answer that question, but I know it's something that the Department of Finance is going to look into. Yeah. Well, thank, listen, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Chair. Thank you. Um, Mitchell Wood. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chair, and thank you for coming today. A number of questions that I had have already been asked, so I'm not going to go into them, but I just want to... Um, 
ask about, and obviously we, 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 all, we heard uh, Nolan programme this morning, <clears throat> but I have a question about Accelerated Passage, and obviously we've covered the issues with the Accelerated Passage calendar um, that was given to us earlier on, but I wanted to tease out with some dates. If we were to legislate for a new legal framework under which a new rate can, rate can be set, how long would that the department need after that for it to be commenced, i.e. come into effect? If it's expect in both scenarios, um, in accelerated passage or through regular legislative passage, because the Bar of Northern Ireland has indicated that it's likely to take at least a year or more to come in, and is that so correct? I, I, we believe it should be commenced within three months of the passage of the Royal Assent. The legislation could come into operation straight away, and the legislation will require um, GAD to set a rate within three months. And as Peter has said, we are, we've already teed GAD up so they could start doing preliminary work while the bill is still making its passage through the Assembly, without assuming the will of the Assembly. But we would take the risk of, of them running some numbers so that hopefully it wouldn't even take three months after the bill receives royal assent for them to come up um, with a figure. OK. And that, 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 that's fine. So it will be three. It, it would, it's not going to be at least a year uh, we think three months. Okay. Um, and it was mentioned there just about the periodical payment that is an option for people. Is that subject to the same rate? No. No, so there the is. Essentially, the periodical payment is an alternative approach to needing to use the discount rate at all because it sets a number which presumably is index linked, but that's all. Um, yes, and you could come back to the court maybe to get the periodical payments order fix. The point about a lump sum is that you have the advantage of taking your two or three or a million pounds and investing it and earning money on that, whereas the periodical payments you will get annually to meet your needs on the annual basis. This, the rate that's up for discussion and debate is only for lump sum yes. payments and affects nothing else. Yes. That's fine. Chair, that's all. All three? No, oh, I'm okay, Chair. You've, all my questions have been covered. Chair, ju just generally, uh, obviously it's an ongoing issue. That we're, we're aware of huge claims against especially government departments and health uh, set aside a considerable amount of money to, to pay out there. <coughs> so is it applicable? The same rate will apply whether it's from an insurance company probably in a lot of cases. Indeed. You know, and we're all aware that those can be yes. huge amounts of money. And it could be a private individual as well that the claim is against. So this rate will apply right across for in in all of these uh, cases of, of it's only a lump serious sum. damage. Yeah, yeah. It's a one-off lump sum, and the objective is to make sure that the 100% claim is paid out. Is that fair? So that over the lifetime they're able to have all of the care that they may need and uh, be able to live a life that they might have been expected to lead. Yeah, and it's quite a drastic change, I suppose, 2.5% to minus 1.75%. Yes. And you feel you can justify it? Well, well it's, I think it's the based on Wales and Wales. That's, yeah. and, and, and that's the, the difficulty that at the minute the 2.5% <coughs> runs the risk of plaintiffs being undercompensated. Yeah, yeah. But, and, but then changing it on Wales and Wales to minus 2% runs the risk of plaintiffs being overcompensated. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, Chair. Thanks very much, folks. That's great. Chair, can I come in with one more point, please? Um, I'll just be quick. I know I did ask previously about, um, I was trying to gauge the number of cases that might exist that are waiting to settle under this, and I appreciate that a lot of it might be um, private individuals and private sector, but have we any measure of how many cases are waiting to be settled against? public sectors or public bodies because if there was a settled amount is there likely to be a large wave at the start of settlements that may be so significant we would need to know about it in terms of budgets i don't think we can know no, that. And I, I imagine departments the department of health or trusts who have cases pending against them will have made some sort of accrual in their account for that claim. I mean, that, well, of course, they won't know are they going to have to settle this with a rate of 2.5% or a rate of minus 1.75% or some other rate. 
but the fact that there's a, a claim in the offing will, will have been accounted for in some way um, in their accounts. And part of the difficulty with making an assessment is that not all claims will necessarily um, be found to be justified, so not every claim will lead to a payment. That's the other point, that it makes it hard to, to, to estimate what the likely impact would be. And there may be claims that, I mean, you have three years from suffering a personal injury to issue in your rent. So, I mean, there are claims out there that we won't even know about. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of things. The periodical payment, is it possible, and, and I'm, I'm assuming this is probably, could only be an arrangement again, it's not something that you could legislate for, for an individual, for example, to settle on the basis of, I will take a periodical payment yeah. for three years, and then I want the lump sum, and... If they did that, would the lump sum then be based on the new rate or the rate at the time at which they settle? I think that would all depend on the, the individual parties to the case and the basis upon which they yeah. settled the case. So I suspect all of those things are possible, but what we yeah. can't do, I think, is to you can't legislate to require that to be and, the and case. And I wouldn't be asking you to. I suppose I was just trying to dig deeper into the... the or uh, Sinead had started us off. And, and I think in theory it is yeah. possible to do yeah. those yeah. things. I suppose, I, I suppose the parties can agree whatever they want, but, but generally they don't seem to like periodical payments orders. Um, yeah, it's an, okay. it's an And the other, the other yeah. question then, it, it's not actually for yourselves, just can we, Chair, as a committee, write to the Finance Minister just to find out what approaches have been made to the Treasury around um, that issue where additional money has been given um, in other jurisdictions, so it, it would be helpful if we know if that's going to happen. And if we could also write to the Health Minister just in relation to that last question that Sinead asked, because I suppose our main concern, whatever about private individuals, and I, I agree with everything Doug said, we absolutely need to make sure people get full compensation, and that's, that's where we'll be at as a, as a committee. And maybe it's not even appropriate for us to ask, actually. As a committee, no, I'll, 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 I'll not go down that road. We can, we can ask well, it as in other roles. I just don't know if we should be asking yeah. as a committee. In danger of asking the, the question that you weren't going to ask. Uh, there, there is an issue here with regards to trying to guarantee full compensation, and the fact that e even the bonds might not deliver the return that someone might require in later life with regards to their illness or disablements or their condition through no fault of their own. But if the condition deteriorates through later life so and, the, and their health care costs go up or require yeah, more it, help. There is always a matter of um, yeah, best judgment that is entered yeah, into yeah. about the level of disablement or damage that has been caused that, that, and the consequences yeah. of that. That is sometimes why cases can take so long to settle until it becomes clear um, the, the patient's long term prognosis, uh, but that's really a matter for the lawyers and the expert witnesses to agree what is this person's annual need for the rest of their life. Do you want to say something about the margin that is included? Yes, in, in Scotland, even uh, when, when you, they run the notional portfolio, um, there is still a, a requirement then for a deduction of 0.5%, which is sort of described as a margin of prudence and which is really, I suppose, a safeguard that to, to minimise the risk of a plaintiff being undercompensated. Of course, the insurance companies will say uh, that runs the risk of them being overcompensated. But, I mean, none of this is a, an exact science. OK, thank you. On, on this issue about a concern of overcompensation, is it, is it not the case, though, that Northern Ireland citizens have been less well off compared to anywhere else in the United Kingdom because this rate that was struck in 2001 hasn't changed? It changed in England and Wales in 2017 and yes I think two and a half percent runs uh, a risk of plaintiffs here being undercompensated which is why cases are not settling or else parties are managing to agree a settlement different from the 2.5 percent. Yeah, so extrapolate that out, the insurance industry, medical negligence claims have actually been protected in Northern Ireland 
in a better way than what has happened in other jurisdictions and victims have been worse off. That's a layman's analysis of this. So I would be a little bit concerned that not moving on an interim rate, which the government actuary has said is appropriate, is predicated on a concern of overcompensation for a victim. I think so what the, the government actually is saying is that the rate is appropriate under Wells and Wells. Yeah. I, I don't think he was offering a policy view on whether we should implement an, an interim rate or whether we should um, go for a new legal framework. In fact, the government actually said that it's unlikely that plaintiffs will invest all of their money in index linked guilts on, on which the, the minus 1.75 is based. And the Department of Finance has been non-committal on this, apart from just being they, careful not to overcompensate. Indeed. But they haven't given a definitive well, view that this would lead to that. We, we've been clear with them that we cannot take account of the impact on the public sector finances in the decision-making that we reach, and they have not sought to influence us on that basis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this, I think, and the Minister's decision, I think, does put you in a very difficult position, Peter, uh, and I don't envy it, and maybe that's why you felt this was somewhat too ad adversarial, but nevertheless, you're now the key policy decision maker. You have assumed ministerial office uh, in respect of this policy area, uh, and therefore there's going to be a challenge uh, function exercise by... Uh, and I'm very, very happy to be challenged, uh, Chair, and um, you know, I, I just... I think that um, the way in which the challenge uh, operates is important, not for me per se, but for my colleagues who come before the committee. And um, you know, it's important, I think, that they shouldn't feel that this is an ordeal to come before the committee, that they should feel that they can come. And you will, by all means, scrutinise and challenge, but also support as necessary. Yeah. Um, so you're keeping under review your decision not to strike an interim rate, that is a, an active consideration? So were, for example, it to become clear that legislation could not be passed during this Assembly term, then I would clearly need to look again at what, whether that was a reasonable decision to have reached. Um, that would be a change in the circumstances I based the decision I took on moving ahead as swiftly as possible to legislate. Um, uh, and in terms of these policy positions, because I note from the, the briefing there isn't actually yet a final, definitive policy position, but we're still waiting on that. In, in what in, sense? In terms of how we're going forward. So, we're going with the well, Scotland you're, Bill. you're considering modifying the Scottish model, as I understand it. So, there is yeah, so, only, uh, really only only in respect of the the 30 year or the the 43 year investment period, but we've instructed council on the the Scotland model. And we, we received it. We, we now have a draft, we bill, draft which bill, which we're looking at, obviously, to test whether it meets the, the policy intent. Yeah. But so there's no bill that has went through the executive yet? The hope is that it will go to the executive um, probably this side of Christmas or the beginning Hopefully of January. Early um, New Year. Um, be introduced in February, subject to um, clearance there and the Speaker's uh, assessment, which takes two weeks, as you know. And in terms of then the accelerated passage, um, when will the department officially decide if it's going to request that and then make the request to come, well, it's usually the minister comes to the committee to provide a official justification for that? I think the process is that request goes to the executive Indeed. at the same time as we ask permission to introduce. Um, then the minister comes to the, committee the, the justice after. committee and then there's a, a, a vote in the assembly. So you'll need executive approval for accelerated passage? Yeah. Um, obviously this involves litigation in terms of defendants and plaintiffs. How concerned, Peter, are you that the department is exposed to litigation from either defendants or plaintiffs as a result of the decisions that have been taken? I think that um, whether we had taken, whatever decision had been taken and Indeed, whether no decision had been taken, we would be at risk of legal challenge. Uh, we have received a number of pre-action protocol letters uh, already, um, and uh, I would anticipate that, um, as I said, whatever decision was reached, there would be at the risk of some challenge. Um, and th th that is pre-action from 
plaintiffs um, in the victims, uh, it's, assuming defendants aren't um, complaining? I think we've received a range yeah. of different... Yeah, um, they are, uh, uh, they are claimants. They're claimants who have made this. Um, and it's more than one. Um, yes. yes. Are you able to tell us how many precisely? That I think it's four at the moment. Yeah. So you have four pre-action protocol act initiatives being taken against the department for not striking an interim rate? That, that's what the... I think there are different, there's a number of different, different grounds, 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 but, uh, but yes. they're based around yeah. that, yeah. So you're looking at judicial review of this decision then? There's going to be court proceedings? Yes. Potentially. Yeah. It's not about the, the new legal framework that they're challenging, it's the... Failure to take a, or the decision not to take yeah. a, an interim rate. And does that include the minister's decision to recuse herself? Is that part of the legal challenge no. at this stage? Okay. Well, it might emerge as an issue, but... Uh, it's not, it's not it's on the front of the letters. Okay. Well, notwithstanding the conversation committee members will, 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 will seek to have, um, I'm, I th I'm very concerned about the course of action that the department is, is pursuing um, in terms of the model that's being suggested and the assembly process and the minister's decision in terms of how she's delegated this um, and I think that's going to be difficult to resolve satisfactorily and in the meantime victims and claimants like my constituent is stuck um, I think very unfairly in what is a cruel decision for those people who want to get a, an opportunity to move on with their life and I think your active consideration of an interim rate is one that probably should crystallise quite quickly in terms of potential for taking through accelerated passage for a new legal framework of which a minority of respondents to your consultation has, su has supported. Um, I think MLAs are going to be left in a very difficult position to, to get on board with the department's assessment and approach in a time frame that I would regard as acceptable to, to claimants. Now, that's, that's my own personal assessment. The committee will need to discuss a committee position that, that we'll want to articulate to the department, but that's where I am at this stage. I'm not sure if I agree with your assessment, Chair, I have to say, because the defendants still have the opportunity not to settle. So people like your constituent are going to be left sitting relying on a defendant to settle with them in the hope that a defendant will settle. I, I'm concerned that we're actually potentially drawing this out unnecessarily. So I think we need to look at both of those, both of those issues, not not from one side. Because I agree with you, if there's a way of making this quicker for victims, then we we need to and want to do it. But if we're potentially be taking our heels and drawing it out to no benefit of the victim or those who are injured, then I, I'm. I think we need to we need to think all of that through and have well, I think a more fulsome discussion around it. No, I think the committee should should discuss it because I suspect we're going to have to to call for witnesses to come, like the bar, the law society, the association of um, personal injury lawyers, uh, to even hear from victims in order to inform members. So um, I I don't disagree that we're going to have to have a a considered committee position around this. Uh, in the consultation, the, the bar supported the Scottish model, if that's any help. Okay, well unless there's any more points of clarity. Can, yeah, can, uh, yeah. can I just, just one more technical point, I um, appreciate the officials being here, now's the time maybe to ask it. Am I right to assume that if there is an extension of the uh, notional timeline against this notional portfolio, if you like, by extending the time, you're actually increasing the lump sum. Would that be a fair assumption? You mean taking thirty years and you mean taking forty-three years instead of thirty years? If you arrived, say for example, somewhere between the two, if you arrived at thirty-five, you know, either way, if you extend it beyond thirty years, it it will have the effect of increasing the lump sum. Is that fair? I think that's something in which I would really need GAD to advise, but very generally speaking, and I'm not an expert, my impression is that the longer the investment period, 
the better the rate of return. So that would mean you, you, there might be a, a, a discount rate which might favour insurance companies more. But that's, yes, I mean, I'm just not an expert yeah. in this, so. I wonder if we might write to the committee on that point, yeah. having sought some expert advice. Wasn't it and perhaps I shouldn't make it without knowing, so I would appreciate that, Peter. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Peter and Lorraine, thank, thank you very much for your time. Um, okay, members. Um, obviously, the department has been seeking to establish a committee position on this matter for a period of time now, um, and members need to be able to consider these issues and try and, and see what view they want. The department is wanting to know if the committee is content with their proposal to proceed as they wish to proceed um, in relation to a new legal framework um, that provides for the government actuary to set the personal injury discount rate with reference to notional portfolio and standard adjustments as prescribed in Scotland. So they are wanting members to be able to give a view on this. So I'm, op I'm open for members' comments. Sinead? I think content is a very big word in this instance. Um, but you know, I do think one of one of the things we're being critical of is the fact that um, accelerated passage is looking quite extensive in this scenario. But I don't wonder if that is actually to our advantage, if we can still manage to get something changed within the remainder of this mandate. And albeit that ex accelerated passage does look longer than it would normally be, then that does create a window for scrutiny. Um, and essentially what we are doing is maybe finding a quick way of legislating, um, albeit by a, a drawn out accelerated passage route. So I, I don't wonder if we've accidentally nearly stumbled on a good solution here um, that we should be really leaning into. Members have any comments? Doug? Okay, Chair, who sets the timetable then for an accelerated passage? Not us. No. So we lose control completely, don't we? There is no committee stage. Yeah, so we lose control of the speed of that accelerated passage. So I, I get what people say it'll be more drawn out, and it might be, but, but we've no control over that. I have a real concern that I just, I have a real concern that I don't have all of the evidence to make a proper informed decision. I don't want it to draw out too much. I don't know what we can do to really speed up the process. You know, by, by us taking control of it to a degree, um, uh, not giving it accelerated passage, but really speeding up our processes to try and get an output, you know, as best as we as we can. Because I do want to hear evidence. Um, you know, this is this is you know, we're talking about big sums here. Um, we're talking about an effect on individual people who deserve this money but we're affect you know people who have to pay this out as well you know we need to look at this uh, i i'm really torn here I'll, i mean i'll listen see what all the members say but see right now I, I i just can't see how i could support an accelerated passage in regards to this paul yeah uh, doug's point i think is valid uh, the only time we really should be considering accelerated passage for any sort of legislation is on a budget process where you've got numbers on a column. Whilst this is financial, it's 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 policy that the government will take forward for many years from now. So I, I would be against in principle accelerated passage on any bill uh, when there's not a good reason enough to do so. Uh, and the only the only thing I can think of off the top of my head that should be used as an accelerated passage is a budget process. So I would have, I think we'd be advocating our responsibilities if we let this go. The only difference between accelerated passage and normal procedure is you lose the committee stage. So every single member of this committee will lose the ability to scrutinise this and to form a judgement on it, and then also to build up an expertise which really is valuable at consideration stage and further consideration stage. Uh, now, uh, to me, it's a joke if they ask for accelerated passage and then they take a year to push it through. What that says to me is, we just don't want the committee to scrutinise this. 
and, and, and whether their t timetable was nominal or aspirational or just safe and conservative, uh, there, there needs to be really good reasons as to why you would exclude the committee scrutiny. And I just don't see it in this regard. And I don't accept the rationale about trying to move quickly to get a decision and policy quickly. Because, as I think the Chair alluded to, you set an interim policy. You set an interim rate, and then you move on from that, and then you are sure of your policy, and then you move on from that. And I think that's a safer way to do legislation, but also to set policy that's going to affect people's lives for now until they die. So I, I think this is a big thing, and we just can't disregard our responsibility and our duty to scrutinise. Linda? Um. I am really not set on whether I would accept the the need for accelerated passage only on the basis that I think that the committee could do it fairly quickly. Yeah. We would have control then of the timeline. You know, we would actually have control of how quickly it happens. Um, and I would be keen that it would happen quickly. <laughs> I suppose where I'm at is that if, if, the, if the committee were to agree that they weren't going for accelerated passage, I would be really keen that we would also agree that we're going to get this through in as timely a manner as we can. The, the committee scrutiny bit is important to me, but it is very narrow in scope, and I think it, it should be something that we could do in a fairly fast time. I suppose, for me, what we've just been through and what we haven't finished yet, the domestic abuse bill, does tell me the importance, the importance for me, to be honest with you, in understanding every single part of the bill is, and where I got to understand that was in this committee and having the conversations about every single clause and hearing what other people's views were because I suppose it's not good to only have your own view of anything in relation to a bill. You need to hear not just the witnesses but actually the other members of this committee who have different experiences and have um, maybe just a different background and different ideas around things. So, I, I, you know, I, um, I do think that the committee scrutiny bit is important. I, w I would accept that. Yeah, to that, because that's a very good point. If we hadn't had the committee scrutiny in the domestic violence bill, consideration stage of that bill would have looked completely different, with no amendments hardly, and, and no debate the way we had a third debate. It would have looked completely different. And that's that's you make a valid point. You really do. Even if we don't make amendments, at least I'll fully understand. Sorry, Sinead. It, at least I'll fully understand at the end of it everything that's in the bill and why I supported it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, chair. I just don't want it to come across that I'm in any way a defender of accelerated passage. I don't think it's a good tool. I don't think it should ever be used. I think it is an emergency um, item that you have to grab if everything else fails. But I'm, I'm conscious of, you know, Doug raised a fair point, who, who sets the timeline? We don't in terms of accelerated passage and the assembly does um, alongside, I, I presume, with the department who has to um, make requests for, a spe you know, assembly space on the floor to to bring things forward. But if, if the assembly, and we don't know this for sure, we don't know if the department have worked um, along with the assembly officials to find out um, if it is achievable within the remainder of the mandate without using the accelerated passage. And we're the best judges of that because that is the part where we're asking ourselves, do we have the committee space and time to interrogate this? And even if it was gone through as an accelerated passage route, I can assure you, I will find the time if it's going through the floor of that house. I know as individual MLAs, we will all be doing that role anyway in terms of scrutinising. Um, but but I do think that ultimately, if if we, you know, when I look at the end game here and the objective, and I would love to see this completed before the end of the mandate, and all those um, people who should be in receipt of the money getting it. And if that did mean accelerated passage in a very slow, sluggish form that this appears to be, I see no reason why, um, even if it isn't on a 
technical basis, I see no reason why we wouldn't be scrutinizing it because it doesn't look that extensive to me. And we do have the power to call in um, those people who we would need to hear from. So I think we would plan one thing off against the other. It'd be playing the assembly timetable to make sure it gets in on the mandate and using the powers of the committee to make sure that we scrutinize it and are satisfied that, that we're doing the right thing. Part of me is concerned, though, that we're being forced into an argument that we need to rush this through to deal with a current pressure when the department have it at their disposal to strike an interim rate, which they've already completed their process at. That this is a new legal framework that will, that will be here for the next 10, 20 plus years, and they'll be for people that haven't yet been left paralysed. And, you know, that's my concern, that something needs to be properly considered. And I'm not convinced, personally, that the Scottish model is the best model. That's, that's you know, I actually see merit in the English and Welsh model. Um, and that, that maybe goes back to the point where, uh, and even though that, that rate in England and Wales is lower than in Scotland, so it doesn't benefit the victim in terms of the current rate that it is, but it gives greater flexibility to, to reflect more immediate changes, both in market and potential impacts on public finances with the medical and medical claims. So I have, I am attracted to it, and I'm also attracted to the fact that there is more ministerial accountability in the English and Welsh model. I know you may want to take the politics out of this, that it's left to the government actuary department, and that, that's that position the department has taken. And maybe I could be persuaded about that. Um, but I have a lot of consideration to do before I would be convinced as to which model is the best. So I, hand on heart, do not know and cannot reach a decision as to whether the Scottish model is my preference or the English model. But the department has said it is the Scottish and they want accelerated passage to do it. So there's, there's a multiplicity of things to consider. Meanwhile, there is the power there to strike an interim rate. And that's what the bar for Northern Ireland has said should happen. It's what the law society have said should happen, and then let us consider this in a in a way that isn't being rushed and forced upon us. And if if defendants and plaintiffs aren't able to reach a settlement because the rate is going to be at minus one point seven five, well, that'll be a matter for them. At the moment, they're not even being given that option to see if they can reach a, a settlement because the department published the interim rate that stopped. The majority of cases from being settled because who would settle whenever you've been told by your legal professionals the department of justice here publishing a, a a new rate which will be to your benefit so therefore we're not going to settle that is now creating this unacceptable backlog and victims are being caught up in the middle of it so uh, to me the department need to proceed with an interim rate and not try to bounce this committee into rushing through a piece of legislation which is going to be necessary both for victims and government departments and the insurance industry for the next 10, 20 plus years. And that's why I'm not convinced with the approach that the department has, has taken on this. So I'm not sure that helps the committee reach a, a position on this. To be fair, Chair, I think, you know, it, it is it is just that, you know, the department's coming at us, and but also the pressures on the department, and, and there's no getting away from the fact that a lot of this was boiling and bubbling over when there was an absence of an assembly, and, and these people have been left out during that time um, when other places have moved on, and they're, you know, now in a different place. Um, so I suppose the department are, to be fair, feeling the pressure, and rightly so, um, and likewise, so should we. You know, there's, there is that pressure on us to find out what can we do in the remainder of this mandate um, to make up for that void you know, that existed when we weren't here. Well, have, have members um, a proposal that they want to put as to whether the committee is going to agree with the department or whether it disagrees or is going to ask the the permanent secretary to, to go ahead and, and consider his interim rate to give us more time. I'm in the hands of the committee here. 
and I'm conflicted as to what the right thing to do is. Doug. Um, Chair, I, I mean, listening to what the, the, the Bar have said and the Law Society have said, um, I, I would propose that we write to the Minister and ask that she writes as she um, uh, implements or strikes an interim rate um, to allow us time to scrutinise um, this, this properly um, and as quickly uh, and as diligently uh, as we can. Linda? My concern around the interim rate is, is, is what I outlined, that I actually think the interim rate is going to prevent defendants from settling where you could potentially have those who are injured. And I know at the minute you obviously have a, a, a number of people who are injured who, who don't want to settle. But there will be some who may have life limiting injuries who are wanting to settle and where you could potentially have a defendant who is determined not to settle because of the, the rate that it's gonna that they're gonna have to settle at. And I, I would have real concerns and I know obviously you can come to some arrangement between the two parties around that, especially if someone's keen to settle in those circumstances. You would like to think a defendant would have some compassion. But we all know when it comes to these issues and it's around money, compassion can very quickly go out the window. So I think I think we need to think about all of the circumstances. And and I am a bit like yourself, I'm conflicted around well, I'm probably more conflicted around the setting of an interim you know, I, I know that probably your position is we should set an interim rate. I'm conflicted about it because I'm not convinced that it's actually going to help the people that we want to help. Sinead, were you wanting to come back in just? Um, I just I appreciate the you know the the honesty in the conversation here because I think we do need to tease this out in terms of you know if we had success let's let's say the committee decided that we um, contacted the permanent secretary and I presume it's him that would be setting the interim rate and not the minister and he decided yes that there there seems to be a conflict and it might be the the best remedy so so then in that instance i'm trying to foresee where are we then you know if there's an interim rate and some defendants won't settle and maybe some will um, and like linda said there's people there who have perhaps life limiting situations who really just want this over and um, what have we actually achieved through the interim rate and is what we achieved worthy of us buying time um, for, and I appreciate the importance, I'm not downplaying the importance of our scrutiny role, but given the, the principal objective of this, I think is non, you know, there's not going to be any argument over this. I think everybody's going to be um, batting for, you know, the 100% to victims or, or those who are due it. I'm not, I'm not convinced, whilst we may buy time, I'm not convinced we we've traded sufficiently to justify the interim period. I think it just could put everything kick down the can, you know, kick it down the road and just stretch out a process that, that already should have been resolved. My, my concern is that um, there may be no support, or not, not no support, there may not be the support in the Assembly to actually change the legislative framework as it currently is. Because I'm not in a position to say that I would support that. Um, you know, so parties and members would need to consider, do they actually feel that we need to change the current legislative framework? Um, and I haven't reached the conclusion that we should. I may be, again, persuaded to do that. You know, but that's the kind of consideration that, that people would need to give to this. In the meanwhile, everybody accepts that the current rate is unacceptable, particularly for victims. Um, and the department has conducted a consultation process on an interim rate uh, and has got the approval from the government actuary department to say that it is appropriate. So I find that a very difficult position for the department to sustain as to why they're not moving ahead with a, a, an interim rate. And I certainly am comfortable to be able to say that they should be proceeding based upon the interim rate given the consultation that's been carried out and the response to it from the government actuary department. Um, continuing with the status quo of this rate, I would find 
um, very difficult to to regard as an acceptable position, uh, and and that's bearing in mind the context of people not knowing and members not knowing as to whether or not they actually feel the department is proposing the right approach. So, you know, there, there's no com there's no there's no guarantee that actually the outcome here would be the assembly voting to approve the department's position, whether it's through accelerated pro passage or indeed through a consideration stage um, process. So you know, my, my own view is to, to be supportive of what Doug has suggested, that there needs to be uh, movement on this interim rate, and then the department can bring forward legislative change through the normal processes. So I'm, I'm in the hands of the committee as to... Sorry, Jim, I think that's a very valid point. You know, if, if it's likely that this isn't, you know, as presented and without the time of the scrutiny for the Assembly to, you know, if it's looking that the Assembly may not support this, then, yeah, but then we're right back at square one and we're sitting with a rate that's unacceptable and, and to nobody's benefit or end. Um, and I can see why when you roll that out. And, and, I'm, and we are being bounced to a degree in terms of, I really want to see this across the line for the end of this mandate. So it is about being very honest about how we get there. And if the interim rate um, is struck and the defendants then move over to the position um, of not settling, That, well, that, that's, a, that's a position then that they need to sustain as defendants, that they're not going to settle. Well, what I'm very uncomfortable with is a, continuing a position whereby the plaintiff is the one that, it is, is, that is at a clear disadvantage. Absolutely, and I have no fear. I mean, you're talking there about the, the plaintiff being overcompensated. That part, I can assure you that I rest easy on that every time, um, because I don't think any of... Uh, particularly those who have been waiting the long game here, you know, um, certainly couldn't be overcompensated now at this stage in my view. So, uh, you know, that's not part of the equation that would concern me, but I'm just concerned that they may not reach that overcompensation because the defendant won't engage. Yeah. My position is the same as Sinead's. I, I mean, I, I, it's not coming out of my pocket at the end of the day, you know, and, and that would be my position. I think that they'll be probably realistically we know very few people get overcompensated for for the injuries that they sustain and in relation to particularly the more serious end of the scale and which is which would be your own constituent and many others like them no no amount of money will ever repay that person for, for what they've been through and, and how they're going to live their lives so i don't think that there's an issue around that but i am really concerned that they end up and you're right it'll be up to the defendant to, to hold the line but they'll hold the line we know how well they do it, and those people will then be sitting. And so I'm concerned we replace one problem with a different problem. We actually legislate for for a new for a new problem that potentially actually leaves people in in a less favourable position instead of where they are at the minute. Because where they are at the minute is a bad place. Do we make legislation to put them in a really really bad place? I could be wrong. I'm, I accept that, but uh, but but we're relying on defendants to do the right thing. My experience is not that that that's not what happens. Doug, yeah, chair. I mean, Linda makes a really good point here, and this is this is a good conversation, um, and it's exactly the reason why I have a problem with with um, accelerated passage is because of you know, what we're we're digging out here. So here's a, here's something, and I don't know the answer to this, so I'm just firing it out here. Can it not be legally possible? If there's an interim rate struck, and then the new rate that is then then brought in, if it is more favourable to the interim rate, can they not then receive like a top up? And I'm not using the right terminology here, but using a top up. So if the new rate, the new proper rate that's been scrutinised and been struck, is 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 more advantageous than the interim rate, then they they get the difference. That allows them. To, to use that interim rate, and that takes away the problem that you're that, that that's being expressed here about an interim rate just taking one problem away and putting it. I don't even know if that's possible, but 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 it certainly. I mean, we make legislation. I'm sure we can do that. Sure. 
Thank you. Right, Chair. On that, um, that, that is why I asked officials, Doug, about the interim payment, um, even if it's at a, and I, and I grabbed from the sky a figure of 75% um, that would create a bridging sort of position, you know, between the permanent um, rate that struck and the interim. And I think an interim payment, now I know they, they had just said it, it wasn't possible, but, you know, maybe it is, maybe it is part of the answer and maybe it is worth exploring. And, and if I can jump in, I'm sure, and we do something similar already with the, the, and I'm using the wrong terminology, the victim's payment scheme, because the victim's payment scheme, um, if somebody's already getting a pension and the victim's payment scheme is greater, there's a top up paid between the two. Do, do, do you know what I mean? So, so, so we do something similar to that already. So, that that might be a way to get around this issue. So, strike an interim rate, and if the new rate after that is is more advantageous, we pay the difference. I suspect the new rate, if you go down the Scottish model, will come up with something like Scotland, um, at not point. 0.75, I think it is, or minus 0.75. Um, this interim rate is considerably more attractive for for victims in Northern Ireland than what it would be in Scotland. So um, I, I would be surprised if the Scottish model came up with a even better rate. Yep. Um, that, but again, I don't know. So hmm. um, that, let me bring in Rachel. Just sorry, Chair. Thank you. Um, this is very complex <laughs> and I still don't pretend to understand every detail. Um, and I'm not gonna pretend that I do. We've been discussing this for an hour and 45 minutes and I'm still unclear about what we should be doing. And I can't decide if Scotland's better than the English model. I, I, I don't have enough information. Um, accelerated passage I'm not a fan of anyway, for anything because that's the whole point of this house, is to scrutinise legislation um, and not have it forced upon us. I do feel we are being a bit bounced here, but at the end of the day, this is about victims and the people who need these payments. I don't know if there is a way, like Doug had said, about doing something in the, with the interim payment, and then what happens is, it does it open people up then to challenge what they'd settled on? Um, I know just from personal experience with dealing with insurance companies after an accident, let's say, being told, look, this is probably what you'll get. A couple of years ago, you'll 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 get this is what you're gonna get. So I would settle now. So we settled. And the other people involved didn't settle and got three times as much because they pursued it on. Now I'm not gonna turn around and go, I'll hear actually I won't do I can't go back. I've settled. So what what happens with people who are maybe gonna settle in the interim? I just don't have enough advice here. I don't have enough detail, and I appreciate that they can't give us all the details. How many people are waiting? What you know? What's going on? But to try and and get a you know an agreement about accelerated passage that removes those exact stages that we can listen to people who do know about this. That's a real problem for me because I don't know about this, and I think we need to get a situation which is the best for people who need it. Um. So I, I need a lot more information on this, um, regardless of the process, if it's accelerated passage or not. I, I need more information to decide. As a committee member, but also as an individual MLA, I'd be voting on that in the chamber. Um, so I don't know what the minimum committee stage could be. If it's 30 days, if we take 30 days, can we take 30 days? Does that, can we, can we call witnesses over that time? Does Christmas get in the way? I'm not too sure. Do we need a wee bit more time? But as it, as it stands, there are so many questions on this and there are very little detailed answers and what is the right way to do things and we have to get it right. I don't know if an interim payment is, or an interim rate is the best way to go. I don't know if picking this down or what could happen and Doug's suggestion, is that something that we need to legislate for or is that a policy decision? No, well, sorry, that, that additional potential top up to compensate if there was a, an area that needed addressed, then yes, legislation would be needed. I suppose what, what I'm trying to operate in is the parameters of what I know is the current legal structures and then what the official process would be for new legislation and members are aware of that by way of taking it through the executive and then the assembly. 
and, and what we know is that the current legal framework um, gives the Minister the power to strike an interim rate. She's delegated that to the Permanent Secretary, so he now has the authority and is keeping that under active consideration. Um, and that, that is a decision that the, the Department could take through the Permanent Secretary now. Um, and that's then without prejudice to how the Department wishes to take forward the new legislation. Um, but that new legislation has to be based upon its policy decisions, and they have taken a decision to go down the Scottish model, which I am not convinced um, is the right way. It may be, um, but in the meantime, they, they are setting aside the power that they have available to them to proceed with an interim rate. And I, I think that is a very difficult position for the Department to sustain. Um, and I'm certainly uncomfortable um, with the approach that the Department has taken for the whole host of reasons that, that I have outlined. Um, Chair, if I um, I think this argument is basically down to the Department thinks this is a yin and yang argument, and they have decided it won't hang, and that's what they're pursuing. And they know that if it comes to a committee, I think that we'll look to see if we can do tweaks and changes to make it better. So yin and yang becomes exploded. So that's probably what they fear. That's probably why I think that's that's why I think they want accelerated passage to take that scrutiny and that part of it out. So they're just going with a clear cut message. This is our policy, this is what we've decided on. We need the assembly to legislate for it and we need them to do it now and then go through the stages. That's what they're leaving out mm -hmm. uh, because they think it's clear cut. It's one or the other, and so we don't need a scrutiny stage. We don't need the committee to be ripping up and putting together and, and all of that. They just want a clear cut through, and that's that's the dilemma we're in. Sure. Can I? Yes. I propose. Can we separate the two issues out and and I suppose come to a, a position because I think we could talk around uh, ring and and. As we know from previous experience, sometimes the more you talk, the more confused you get. I do think that we probably have a fair amount of information. I think what Doug has said about the interim payment stuff, I accept actually the department could not legislate for that. I've been through this around with the HIA stuff and believe you me, it just we tried everything around that. It was not possible to do it and actually was gonna delay things even further than, than the, longer than those people had to wait and I'd accept the same thing is likely to happen. In this case, I think that Doug's issue around, you know, is there potential then for a top up? It's more likely to be that they will get more than they should have got. So, are you going to go back after them looking that money back? You can't. And no department would legislate for that, and I, I, w I wouldn't legislate for it. So, none of those things. So I think you have to decide: are we are we pushing for an interim payment as a committee? Are we are for that interim rate? Are we pushing for that as a committee or are we not? And then the other issue is the accelerated passage or not. Those two things are two separate things in my view and I think we just make a decision on whether we're pushing for that interim payment. We don't have to make a decision today on the accelerated passage stuff, but I mean, I'm open to that as well. Well, for me, the two are connected because if the department strikes an interim rate, there's absolutely no justification for accelerated, accelerated passage. passage. Yep. My view. Um, but if, if they proceeded with that interim that gives us the time to, to carry out the process. Um, so I'm happy. To well, take we firstly take a decision around the interim rate then, because well, if that's they're, they're likely to take their day from us. Well, and I, I'm, I'm definitely, but likely. So Doug had indicated, and I'm happy just to repeat it for clarity, so he can reach a, a view on it that the department um, needs to reconsider their decision not to move forward with the interim rate and the committee would be asking them to revisit that decision um, in, in terms of going forward with the interim rate um, that they had consulted upon, got advice from the government actuary which said it was an appropriate rate because that's very important to me in terms of that uh, consultation with them, and that they got from them um, and that they should be proceeding with that interim rate. Is, does anybody disagree with that position? I, d I disagree with, with it. It's appropriate based on Wales and Wales. It's not, appro not That doesn't mean it's appropriate. They're two different things. And I disagree with, I suppose, the, the, well, 
I think I disagree with the interim rate based on the concerns that I have that the defendants will dig their heels in and we will have people who want to settle and the defendants are refusing to settle based on the rate and, and they can't come to an agreement around an agreed rate which could be I can't I can't decide what will happen on either side of that at the end of the day those those are things completely out of our control all we can do is around the legislation we we'll understand where you're coming from in relation to that you're absolutely true. but I have that concern and for me it's always about allowing at least the ability for the injured party to get a settlement and do, is that decreased by setting this rate and not allowing or not or in a, a circumstance then where that you have the defendant absolutely digging their heels on. Just make the point, it's not the committee ultimately that takes this decision. Yeah, no, I know that. With the department, I know that. You know, but we're given a, an indication as to how the department should be trying to proceed. Ultimately, this rests now with the permanent secretary to decide, not the minister, the permanent secretary. So the committee can't take the decision, yeah. but we're, we're obviously trying to, to highlight and the kind of issues that the Permanent Secretary should now be considering. Sinead, you, you wanted to come in. Thanks, Chair. Yes, I, I take your point. The interim rate is connected because if it's struck, then yes, why would you be asking for accelerated passage? But it's also true to say then, if, you're, if accelerated passage is no longer justified because there's an interim rate sitting there, then it's also connected to the the legislative timetable for the remainder of this term. So what's the likelihood? We don't know. What's the likelihood of uh, that being passed through the Assembly before the end of this mandate, not using accelerated passage? Well, the, the only comment to make on that, the, the Department's position has been, has been based upon their concerns that this committee isn't able to handle four bills that may overlap. So. You know, that, that, that is the justification that the minister or the department is saying that they believe puts at jeopardy their legislative program. It's not, as I could understand from them, um, the lack of capacity in their department to manage this. It's more their concern for this committee. Well, that's very tempting. Um, but I, I have to ask, um, you know, do we as a committee fail? Because I think we all have very shared objectives here. And I think we can recognise the concern that, you know, striking the interim rate, removing accelerated passage would be the, an ideal if we thought um, the, the, the defendants were going to settle. But, you know, we have to be real. We know that a lot of the people who are waiting for settlement won't receive it until there's actually legislation put in place in a permanent rate. And if I thought the sequencing could run that we uh, strike an interim rate, remove accelerated passage and get this across the line before the end of the mandate, that's where I would like to be on it. Well, yeah, we're going to go around the houses here, I think, all night, uh, to be fair. Uh, the, the, the interim rate deals with the speed issue. It doesn't deal with the fact that the, the department think that their policy is best and they don't want anybody to deviate from that and that's what they want people to vote for in the Assembly Chamber. So it's the yin and yang argument still there. So the, the interim pay, uh, payment deals with the haste and speed issue. It doesn't deal on the argument and the policy drive from the department. Uh, I, I am of the mind to support Doug. If Doug has made that a proposal to uh, to push the department for an interim payment. Rate. Uh, sorry, rate. Sorry, you're absolutely right, rate. Then I'm happy enough to second that proposal and then put it to, to the committee just to see if we can get something crystallised and finalised. I think, just for clarity, Doug's proposal is in line with what Sinead said would be the preferred yeah. option, that you proceed with a, an interim rate and the Assembly can still legislate through the normal process. I think that's an accurate reflection, Sinead, of what you're saying. It would be, but at this moment in time, I have no assurance that that can be done. I have no assurance that um, by taking a committee view of an interim rate, we can get legislation in place. So, you know, I can't say absolutely yes. I couldn't support that today because I don't know what assurance have I got that we're going to get it across the line before the end of the mandate. Well, can I then make a suggestion that maybe if we don't vote on the interim rate, that we vote, can we vote then on the accelerated passage piece and come to a considered view then? 
it, I suppose, is anyone suggesting that we should proceed with accelerated passage? Is that a position that anyone's going to articulate? Okay. So I'm not going to recommend that we would be going down the route of accelerated passage. To be fair, we haven't formally been asked for that, but I think it is connected to position on you know, the kind of advice we should be giving to the department. Um, I, I don't support accelerated passage. Unless someone's going to tell me that they do. Because has the committee agreed that we don't support accelerated passage? Does any, anybody want to vote against that? Okay. Can we make a decision on that in the, be, in, in the absence of having been asked and heard maybe further arguments? But I, I think we we'll probably have heard most of the arguments, to be fair, but I'm, I'm, so I, look, I'm okay. With but I, okay, in, in terms of that, this is to, in order to indicate to the department that the committee is not persuaded that we should be accepting accelerated passage. Certainly not persuaded at this time. So granted, they, view. they could come with a formal position on that and ultimately the Assembly has to vote on it, but in terms of providing an indication to the Department as to where the committee stands, if we're able to give an indication that we're not supportive of accelerated passage. Yeah, Chair, because we're here, we're here not only to scrutinise but to, to support and advise, so if we can advise the committee or the Department of that, then that's fine. If we can't, if we can't make a settled position, then we let it sit and the, the, the onus is on the Department still. So, members are content that it is an accurate reflection of the committee position that we are not in a position to support accelerated passage as things stand today, based upon all of the representation that we have received as a committee. Ha having taken that position, that then takes us back to then the current area around um, the hiatus that's been created by not taking a decision on the interim rate. And so, um, there's been a proposal there that uh, the department needs to reconsider its position not to move forward with uh, an interim rate. Does anybody take a contrary position then that the department shouldn't be looking again at that decision not to move forward with the interim rate? Chair, can I just come in on that previous point first? I think it's, a, it's important for us as a committee when we're communicating our, um, that we're not satisfied about the accelerated passage I think it's important to set the record straight that we as a committee are also willing to engage and work with the department to talk about the legislative timeline for the remainder of this mandate that we're willing to it's not that we're walking away from this yeah, yeah. no i think that that's an important mm -hmm. point to clarify that the committee um makes that explicitly clear that um we would be able to process legislation um through a committee consideration stage, and in no way should that be regarded as an obstacle to proceeding with legislation. Um, however, I think the committee position here is one where there is not a clear view that actually we support the Scottish model, which is the policy decision so far that has been taken, upon which the legislation is going to be drafted. So I think that would need to be reflected, that the committee still hasn't reached a position as to whether or not the policy decision is actually the, the, the right one being taken forward by the department as well. So in terms of then the, the issue there around the interim rate, the committee will then convey that um, the department should be looking again at, the, at their decision not to proceed with an interim rate. Are members content then that we reflect the, the, this discussion and that agreed position to the department on those issues? Great. Sorry, Chair, that broke up on me. Can I ask you to repeat that again? Yes, of Sorry. Just, just that, that the committee position would now be reflected to the department uh, uh, in, in terms of the accelerated passage that we discussed. The highlighting, though, that that is in no way indicative that we're not prepared as a committee to take this through the Assembly um, within this mandate and through the normal process of committee scrutiny stage that we would expedite efficiently. Um, um, but that is also notwithstanding that this committee hasn't reached a decision uh, that we don't know if we support either the Scottish model or the English and Welsh model and I think that there would need to be 
more engagement with the department around that policy decision which they have taken um, with this committee and allow us to, to speak to different stakeholders in order to, to help reach a decision on that because I think that's important because it's that, that policy decision is what the department are planning to go to drafters to actually produce a bill on um, and, and based upon that context then the department need to reconsider the position that they have taken not to proceed with the interim rate that they have consulted upon and that the government actuary department has said is an appropriate rate. Are members content? No, I'm not on the on the interim rate. I'm, I'm not just because I'm not convinced that we're doing the right thing for 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 the injured party. Okay. Convinced either way, to her, but um, yeah. Rachel. I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna sit in the fire. I don't know. Okay, no. so are we? I'm trying to get to a position where we've created as much consensus as we can. So if there's an alternative proposal as to how we take this forward, I'm happy to hear it, that we can relay to the department. I mean, at this stage. Sure. The department asked us specifically if we have a committee position on the interim rate. They, they, they have asked us to indicate our position as to their proposed way forward. But that didn't the interim rate, did it? No, it does. Well, their proposed way forward is not to proceed okay. on the interim rate and then to legislate based upon the Scottish model. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, do, I don't think I refer to from my hearings of it. I don't think we have a committee position on the interim rate. That's that's what I'm trying to <laughs> to to get to. So that if we if we aren't able to agree a position on that, what is the committee position? Is it? And I go back then. We do we support the department? Do we support accelerated passage based upon the Scottish model? I don't think it's an either or. We don't have to support the accelerated passage in order not to have a position in relation to the interim rate. The, the department can take a go back and look at it and say we're not getting accelerated passage. We're concerned that there'll be legal cases against us so therefore we maybe sh maybe we should they're already saying that that is something that they're actively still considering so i mean that would be a decision for peter and he could look at it and say we probably in light of all of that it would be best that we do the interim rate that's a decision for them to take i don't think we have to give them a committee position on it to be fair I don't know. and i think to be fair i was trying to uh, encapsulate that in terms of the position the committee position there was to outline that we didn't support at this stage the accelerated passage route, uh, that we did uh, want to commit to saying that we would proactively and efficiently work with the department by way of legislative processes through a committee consideration stage. However, the committee hasn't reached a position that it actually supports either the Scottish model or the English and Welsh model, which is different to the department taking forward. And in light of that, the department should reconsider the position that they have taken in respect of the interim rate. So I wasn't suggesting and proposing they now should strike the interim rate, but they need to reconsider their position in light of the committee's position around accelerated passage and not being able to reach a view on either the Scottish or the English model. Review rather than reconsider, because reconsider to me would say I'll not fall out over review because I, I, I regard it as the but same I'm okay thing, with review, but that's up to the department to I think we would be very clear on I'm that. I'm okay with review as well. Okay. Agreement. Should you have a view of that? <laughs> uh, no, Chair, I, I just think um, that's like us telling him what, you know, here's our position and here's what you maybe want to do about it. <laughs> um, so it is us, you know, starting to tell them how to deal with our view. Um, not sure if that's wise. We should just give our view. And this is where I'm trying to get the consensus that we, we have a, as a view that is as representative as possible for the committee. So, well, that's a, we don't have a consensus, so, so we don't give a view around the interim payment at all. Or the interim, interim rate, we're going to get this right at some stage. And, and I think we can leave it at that. I mean, 
this conversation, I'm sure the department will have been listening. They're aware that there certainly are members on the committee, and there is a feeling among members of the committee that they that they that they should look again at that. I, I think that's that's fair enough. Allow them to do that, and just leave that out of out of um, out of the equation at this stage if we don't have a committee consensus position on it. So, yes. yeah, it's really difficult for, for us to come to view. You know, if there was an interim rate, let's say there was an interim rate set next week for the period of the remainder of this mandate, and we knew that the permanent rate was going to be set before we leave this place or, you know, the mandate expires, I would be 100% comfortable with that. But to introduce an interim rate with no real timeline on the legislative program or passage. That, that leaves a lot of people in a very vulnerable position. And I wouldn't like to think the interim rate could be used as a, as a tool to just delay things further. And that's why I, I, I don't think there is a committee view on the interim rate. And if they haven't asked for it, I don't think we should be explicitly pulling it out. It's only part of the problem here. Okay, so I'm trying to establish a committee view. Usually I would recommend, and be very clear in my recommendations, but I'm trying, members are expressing their view on this. Um, we need to relay to the department uh, a position of some sort. Is it the will of the committee we relay to say we're not able to reach a position on all of this? We, we, we no, I think we've, we've clearly passage. reached a position on, on the accelerated passage. We don't need to tell the department you should reconsider or not reconsider, but they can decide that themselves. They can decide whether they think they need to look at the interim rate themselves and take responsibility for that as a department. Okay, so I'm going to bring Doug in at one stage because he initially, the proposal was only around the interim rate, to be fair to him, and not on this other aspects. Um, so it would be the context of the committee isn't in a position to support accelerated passage. We would, however, work with the department um, to expedite this through the normal legislative scrutiny processes. However, the committee is not in a position to, to indicate that it actually supports the proposed way forward, which is the Scottish model, because we haven't been able to interrogate all of the information, and the, the committee would wish to do that by way of evidence from all of the relevant stakeholders in order to provide advice to the department. Have I encapsulated a committee view on that aspect of everything? Does anybody disagree with that? Can you repeat it? No, I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're agreed on that. Um, park that, and that takes us then that to the interim rate issue. Yeah. Is it the view then that the committee remains silent on that? Um, or that there needs to be a view expressed, even if that is representative of the range of views around it, or we just remain silent? And let me go to Doug, because he had made the proposal. I, 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 think, I think, Chair, listening um, to everybody, and, and, and it's a good conversation, I said it already, everybody has expressed a view and a concern of some description uh, around the interim rate. Uh, I think um, that I will withdraw my uh, proposal in regards to that. Uh, what I believe we do is say nothing about the interim rate. Um, we give uh, our our position as you've already described it as, and then the the the, um, the the justice department then need to decide whether they feel that given that this might this has to go through a process that they want to to strike an interim rate. It sits with them. It's their issue. It's for them to deal with, and I don't think we need to give a view uh, on that. Um, you know, just just deal with the first piece that you you spoke about. Okay. Okay. Well, then, listen. Thank you, members. I know that took some time, um, but it's important that we reach the this consensual uh, position on all of that as we did. So, thank you for your your patience and respect of that. We shall move on then. Um, item five: the maximum number of judges order, twenty twenty. Pages 169 to 175, the stat rule will increase the limit on the number of High Court judges from 10 to 15. This will allow further appointment of part-time judges and will allow headroom 
for the addition of judges that may be required as a result of unforeseen pressures. At our meeting on the 22nd of October, the committee considered the proposal for the statutory rule and agreed that it was content with it. The statutory rule was laid by the Department of Justice on the 11th of November. It's subject to affirmative resolution procedure and there's been no changes to the policy content since the committee considered the SL1 and the examiner of statutory rules has confirmed that she has no issues to raise with the technical aspects of the rule. So members are asked uh, to indicate that they are content then with the statutory rule and if so I'll formally put the question that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2020 forward slash 248 the maximum number of judges order Northern Ireland 2020 and recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Members agreed? Agreed. agreed. Okay well members you'll have noted from the order paper it's down from Monday the 14th of December in terms of the um, debate on it. Item 6, the Department proposes to make a statutory rule to provide for the procedure of special postal administration regime. The Postal Services Act 2011 allows for the designation of a postal operator as a universal postal service provider to be responsible for the minimum service of delivery of letters six days per week across all UK postal addresses at uniform affordable prices. Uh, the 2011 Act puts in place a special postal admin regime designed to ensure the continuance of the Universal Postal Service in the event that a company providing that service is at risk of entering insolvency proceedings. The Insolvency Service, a branch of the Department for the Economy, is responsible for insolvency policy. However, the Department has responsibility under Article 359 of the Insolvency Order uh, 1989 for making the rules governing insolvency procedure with the concurrence of the Department for Economy. Where the rules affect court procedure, the Lord Chief Justice must also occur. Statutory rule is subject to negative resolution. Members are content with request the views of the Committee for the Economy on the proposed rule before we would reach a decision, given that it is that uh, department uh, which is responsible for insolvency policy. And again, if members are agreed, we'll also write to the Department of Just Justice to clarify the update position of Companies House and the Enforcement of Judgments Office on the proposed rule as this has not been made clear in the information provided by the Department. If members are agreed with that approach. Agreed. Item 7. At the meeting on the 10th of September, the Committee considered a written update on the work undertaken by the Legal Services Agency for Northern Ireland to address the Audit Office and Public Accounts Committee recommendations and qualifications in respect of Legal Aid Committee sought further information on a number of issues and requested a copy of the Business Consultancy Service Interim Report in respect of fraud and error and the 2019 Official Error Report when available. I provided a copy of both reports. The Official Error Report estimates the amount of legal aid um, to be uh, estimated to have been paid incorrectly due to official error is at just over £8 million. Pounds. Over the review period, uh, period, which comprises just over £6 million pounds of overpayments and approximately £2 million pounds of underpayments and represents around 11.1% of total payments completed between January and December of 2019, excluding uh, deemed errors in the amount of legal aid estimated to be incorrectly paid incorrectly at 5.7 million over the period that represents 7.7 percent. <coughs> so members, if there's no <coughs> information, um, unless members are wanting to pursue this further, Linda. Just, I mean, the suggestion that maybe we should ask for an oral briefing. I, I yeah. certainly would like more detail around that money that is an error so you know what type of error are we talking about who is getting that money whose error is it is it departmental is it at the legal <coughs> solicitors and barristers is it the individual themselves so it's just about establishing where are the patterns where are the difficulties is it something that can be actually resolved where it's it's genuine error but for a particular reason, you know, is there is there some way of resolving it? I just would like a wee bit more detail around that. Now, whether we need an oral on that or whether oh. we can get that as written, I'm I'm content either way. But I really would like more information around that. Okay. Well, listen, we can schedule an oral briefing session if members are agreeable. Yeah, chair, sure. just on that, I would I would agree with that. You know, <coughs> having been involved with the Public Accounts Committee some years ago, 2016, and saw the report on. Um, Legal aid. I think we were all shocked with 
the slackness there was within the whole organisation. Uh, there's been a whole, a whole reform process put in place, we're aware of that. So we'd like an update on it and see how efficient and effective they are and the improvements that have been made. It is important that there is continuous improvement. And we want to see evidence of it. And it's a lot of money, it's public money, and it should be properly accounted for. And, and I think we, as, as a committee, have every right to scrutinise it as closely as we possibly can. So I would fully support having another oral session on it. Thanks, Chair. Okay, well, listen, let's schedule an oral session. Sinead? Yeah, Chair, I think it's important because this is way outside any margin of error that I think we should be comfortable with. And I notice as well, um, we need to really focus in on the recruitment part um, the talk about it being suspended due to COVID. And I would love to know just where we need, we do need to get an update on that. Thank you, Chair. Listen, let, let's get that scheduled then. Um, item 8, proposals to reform the rehabilitation period in Northern Ireland, uh, pages 239 to 264. The Department has written advising of its intention to undertake an 11-week consultation. Well, when it's 12, then it's 8, now it's 11. That must be in NDNA too. <laughs> Um, consultation on proposals to reform rehabilitation periods in Northern Ireland to reflect changes in sentencing practices which have meant that longer sentences are now being imposed than when rehabilitation periods were first established and developments in other jurisdictions where rehabilitation periods have been shortened and more sentences are capable of becoming spent. The Department has provided a copy of that draft consultation document. Um, it's planned to publish a summary report on the consultation responses and then has offered an oral briefing session once those have been received and analysed and recommendations developed. So it's members, um, if we're content to note um, that that's going to be put out for a proposed consultation period for 11 weeks. Rachel? As you said, Chair, um, I, I have to say I did laugh at this. It did make me smile. Um, the 8, 12, 11, 6, I, where does this come from? Um, I appreciate that it's re to reflect Christmas and New Year, absolutely. But is there? I I was under the impression that at twelve weeks, and then it was eight, and now eleven. Is this normal? Um, so I would like to get a wee bit more on the eleven weeks. But I would also have noticed that there's there's no reference in this in this letter to any discussions, pre-consultation discussions with any stakeholders. We usually get that, that it's been, if there's been a task and finish group or something, or maybe they just haven't. So I would like to understand, has there been any relevant stakeholders spoken to with regards to this consultation? Um, and, and, you know, why now? I suppose it's, there's just, there's not enough information here that we usually get in terms of a consultation. Um, request, but um, you know, I'm happy that it goes ahead. I just want a wee bit more background because the background is um, three bullet points long. Paul? Yeah, just on this, uh, I'm led to believe through the context I have within the world of justice that there has been no pre consultation on this. Um, so I would want to know why, um, why that is the case, why people haven't been consulted in a wider sense before the consultation. Now. I know you can consult on a consultation on a consultation, but these are people who work in this day and daily, who who are at the cutting edge, and they weren't informed or consulted on any aspect of this consultation. Uh, so that surprises me. I think there's a weakness in the system. Now, they can't blame that on COVID. Maybe they can, maybe they will try. But I want to know why there's been no pre-consultation. Maybe it's not justified in this regard, but then I think they need to tell us why it's not justified. our party are glad that it's up to 11 weeks to be fair <laughs> gives Christmas time to, to, to try and respond to some of these consultations um, yeah, per, Rachel and, and Paul have, have outlined the issue already, it is just finding out were there any pre-consultation conversations because sometimes that's where the change in and I know it's my experience from a lot of consultations that came to the policing board from Justice, where, where the, it might have been for eight weeks, and we generally bounced it back and said we want, because you would have found it was eight weeks over the summer period, very often, and we would we would have always asked for it to be, to be extended. I, I think the longer you can have a consultation period, unless it's extremely narrow and you kind of can assess that it, it's not, you're not going to get any great response to it. It's important to try and get as many 
I think something like this is is an important enough issue to want that longer. Okay. Well, listen. Um, let, let's ask for that information. Um, maybe better asking for that before we actually agree to it. Um, the, you know, point of principle yeah. actually that we need to be satisfied around these issues, and then we can come back to it. Like I don't have any real problem in what they're trying to do in terms of the consultation, and we let it go. But the points have been raised, and let's seek the answers to that, and then we can um, make progress with it if members are content. Yeah, and I suppose it's marking the card for future. I think anyway that that you wouldn't do a consultation. Okay. Um, <laughs> item nine. The Department of Justice has written advising of its intention to undertake a <laughs> ten week consultation on proposals for domestic abuse protection notices and orders in developing the proposals the department has considered the approach in neighbour neighbouring jurisdictions and is engaged with statutory, voluntary and community sector partners. The list of representatives it has held discussions with is included in the paper. The department has provided a copy of the draft consultation document. Uh, the department will provide further briefing to the committee once responses to the consultation have been analysed and final recommendations um, developed. So, members, we, we'll, we'll highlight in the same letter, one's 11 weeks and one's 10 weeks, and previously it had been 12 and then it had been 8, um, and if we can have an explanation around that. But are members content that we would note this proposed consultation and then we can consider the matter further? Okay. Okay. Um, if I can take agenda item... Just slightly out of order, 14 hours. It's the health protection regulation, the assembly debate. Um, and correspondence was received from the Department of Justice on the 1st of November regarding health protection regs related to COVID-19, and they're scheduled to be debated on the assembly on 8th of December. It's therefore been necessary to add this item to the agenda today. And the relevant papers are on pages 66 to 108. The Justice Minister is going to lead the debate. As some of the re regulations relate to offences, fines and enforcement for breaches of the regulations. Um, and as committee chair, it's expected that I would then speak in the debate. Now, although the committee did receive the COVID-19 updates and briefings, um, as we know quite regularly, no information at any stage was received um, on this, and there was no engagement by the department with the committee on the review of fines and penalties and the changes that were subsequently proposed. The committee has therefore had no opportunity to consider or reach positions on them. Now, the statutory rules are the responsibility of the Department of Health. The review of offences and penalties was, though, carried out collaboratively by the Department of Justice and the Department of Health, and it was the Minister of Justice who recommended the proposed changes to the executive which were considered on the 8th and the 15th of October. Um, there was therefore, in my view, more than adequate time for the Department of Justice to inform this committee of the proposed changes before this week. So, in terms of being able to reflect a committee position, um, that I would be reflecting those comments that we haven't been engaged with, um, we should have been engaged with it, uh, on this issue, but ultimately the committee then doesn't have a committee position, and the parties will, will, will obviously take positions on it. The health committee is the committee that has considered these rules, and therefore it'll be that committee will obviously do more detailed commentary in respect of the rules because those members have considered the statutory rules in respect to the these issues, irrespective of the fact it was the Department of Justice that actually led on this in the executive, and then. then speak to us. So that, that's going to be the nature of the contribution because the committee hasn't taken a position on this, if members are content to note that position. Paul? Yeah, uh, good luck with the Minister trying to convince me that these fines are proportionate and the enforcement of such are proportionate when you can't even dip your toe into the sea in Helms Bay and for other places in the North Coast uh, without fear of being fined £200. Um, the one thing I would say is this, with this draconian legislation there is a massive democratic deficit. And for them not even then to keep this committee informed is horrific. 
Um, now, again, these things are all fast moving. That in itself is undemocratic. Uh, the Assembly has been passing these pieces of legislation retrospectively for weeks and months, which is horrendous. Uh, way back when, when this all was being talked about, I don't think any of us ever considered that it would go down this road. Uh, it has. Um, and if our role as a committee is to scrutinise, advise and support, then Committees must be treated with better respect, greater respect than they have been. Now, I'm not sure whether it's all committees or whether it's just a justice thing. I don't know how health's operating at the minute. I, I, uh, I dread to think. So I want to put down a marker that, first of all, I am horrified with the democratic deficit, with the re respectivity of it all, and the fact that we haven't been engaged with the department on these issues, and they haven't engaged with us, I should say, and that we haven't even been able to assuage and assess whether these fines are proportionate, when you consider all of the other fines that can be laid down by these constables and all of our court fines, uh, how we haven't been able to scrutinise that and assess what's proportionate and what's not. And then to get on to the actual enforcement of these laws and the way the police have operated in the past, because we've raised this before in the committee, I raised the issue about uh, a couple travelling out from Bellamina to Bershain to bring hot food to a relative, to an elderly uh, mother, and the police turned them around. That's, this is horrendous stuff, and whilst the police were in error in that regard, that's the danger you have with draconian legislation, that the police don't read it right, they then are influenced by media, and then we get into a really horrific situation where people walking, families walking on a beach, families and people swimming in the sea, are being prevented from doing so, or being threatened with a £200 fine. That's where we're at. Uh, so I am not at all pleased with this, um, and I'm glad I'm able to get that off my chest. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm not sure, Sinead, your hand is up. Yes, come on ahead. Chair, no, uh, do you know there's something really wrong here in terms of the process, and I raised it on the floor last week. So it it appears that if a department is the um, the department, for want of better language, is the department that owns, you know, the regulation that's coming forward. Um, that work happens within that department, but not in that scrutiny committee. Does everything go through health? Because there was a real problem last week on the or this week on the floor. Whenever the minister for health was speaking to regs, which were really from education and economy, and I note in this instance, I think it is the minister for justice coming to the floor. Um, but there seems to be a breakdown, I think, maybe from executive office outward. If it belongs to a department, surely all the committees under each department should be privy much sooner. And I appreciate it's a retrospective piece, but even it just doesn't seem to be well thought out. I'm not even sure the executive office know what the position is in terms of which minister stands on the floor to speak to it. Rachel. Thanks, Chair. I just would like to know, there's a, there's a couple of issues with these actual regulations in terms of when they say they've been laid and when they've actually been signed off. Um, Amendment 14 is particular concern. It was said to us that it was uh, signed on the 13th. It wasn't. It was signed on the 30th. Um, and there are also inter, there's still ongoing legal issues with the interaction between Public Health Act and these health protection regulations, which I think are being um, currently looked at with the Department of Justice. But is this going to happen going on forward now? Are we going to have, like Sinead said, was an issue, which was, it was all, it, they were all education regulations, they were all to do with it, with schooling and, and, and pupils. Is this going to happen? Because as I appreciate, Minister Swan has got a lot going on, and it, it's, if it's within the department, but I don't feel as if Minister Swan should be coming to talk about police enforcement and um, 
convictions and fines whenever it sits within this committee. So is this the start of this going forward that we're going to have the relevant minister come into the House um, to, to lay, or retrospectively lay, which is just bizarre, um, things that have happened in a previous month? Is this, is this now the way of it? And are we going to be getting new amendments that are actually reflective of what's going on, such as Amendment 14 with the powers in the Council? Or are we going to be passing them in 2022? Well, in terms of the procedure of this, and I'm, I'm on dangerous ground here because I don't have a, a legal opinion on this, um, so this is just my assumption of how things are being done. Um, the regulations are all coming through the Department of Health, even when in this case, for example, the Department of Justice has led on it in the executive. But by virtue of the way this legislation is being enacted, it comes through that department, even though the Minister for Health hasn't been the primary initiator of it at executive level. But he is the vehicle, or that department is the vehicle for them coming into law. That's why then it's the Health Committee which has to do the scrutiny work on this. And they're obviously doing this every week. Um, now there's a question there about how, on this issue for example, the Health Committee contacting this committee to get a view before it has agreed its position. Um, there's a procedural question there. Um, but nevertheless, why did the Minister for Justice and the Department for Justice not engage with this committee that even though it is legally the Department of Health and the Health Committee that have to pass these regs at committee level? Would there not have been a, a, an obligation on the Department of Justice to have engaged with this committee to seek views to help us to provide advice and support so that the Justice Minister, when she was taking this forward to the Executive, would have had that um, level of advice from the, the Scrutiny Committee? Um, because she's obviously taken the decision to lead on it in the Assembly. Um, so I think there's very valid questions there to be asked. Sinead? Yeah, Chair, I just think, you know, you summed it up correctly there, but I think it may be a systemic failure across all departments. I don't know. I'm, I'm only speculating. Would it be worth our while at writing to the executive office to, you know, ask for it from that level to be filtered down, that even though it goes to health committee, that um, the sponsoring department should also be notified? Yeah. Their commitment, sir? Yeah, no, I think that's a valid point that's being made. Um, I'm going to ask Christine just to outline the committee process for how these regs are being dealt with. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, there's a normal process for committees to look at, at various issues um, that fall within the remit of other committees, but my understanding is that the Health Committee have to deal with so many of these statutory instruments um, and in such short order that they haven't sought input from other committees. Um, because they simply just don't can't process them quickly enough, and they're coming to the floor of the house. So, um, to be fair to the health committee, I think they do understand the process that we would normally follow. But in these instances, it's not possible for them to do so. Okay, chair, I just make the, the point. Um, I think we all need to remember, you know, that we're still in a health pandemic. You know, that these uh, health protection restrictions are, are there for, for real reasons and you know the police have had a very difficult job in trying to enforce it and uh, as someone who's elected representative for the North Down area I was contacted by people who were there and I think the, uh, the way the police handled it was probably not in their best wasn't one of their best days I think in relation to PR but having said that uh, I have discussed it with senior officers who, uh, I suppose, give me a rundown of what happened, give me the evidence, and no one was issued with fines at Helms Bay. I think that's important to make clear. No one was issued with them. Um, they did certainly contact a lot of people who were there on the beach. There seemed to be quite a number of people there, more than normal, um, because it is a popular area. And this sea swimming, freshwater swimming, is very popular. I don't recommend it. I haven't gone there, to be honest. It's <laughs> this time of the year, I don't think it's it's uh, a great idea. It's very popular, great, and a very uh, pleasant spot. But um, 
I think how it was managed, as I say, is the issue. The police, to be fair, uh, reminded me on the same weekend they issued a number of, I believe, 20 fines to um, those that participated in a house party in Bangor. And uh, they did issue them. You know, so I think, to be fair to the police, it is difficult and it is very difficult to, to manage, but uh, I think we need to be supportive of what they've done in, dif in difficult circumstances. And they obviously, they have lessons to learn as it, pro as it proceeds, but it's necessary because of the health pandemic, and I think it needs to be kept in that context. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. OK. <coughs> yes, sorry, oh, Linda. I think what Gordon's just said is actually supports what has been said by the other members that we actually do need to have some conversations and discussion around the actual legislation because the police can only do what they can do within the confines of what, what we give them the powers to do or what we don't give them the powers to do so I, I think that now don't get me wrong there are times when I still do the wrong thing as do all different statutory agencies it's just the nature of of life, but I think that we have to be careful what powers we're given out, <clears throat> so that we are we can stand over it. Then, whenever somebody does come back to us, that either they haven't carried out in the way, manner in which we intended through the legislation, or that particular agency or body, whoever it is, you know, I don't care if it's, it's the police or if it's the housing executive, if if we've given them powers and they've carried them out correctly, then we can stand over that. If we've given them powers and have carried them out incorrectly, then they have to accept responsibility. But we have to be ensured sure we're given the right powers. Okay. Well, obviously the health committee is being swamped, and I understand their position to turn this round um, in the time that they need to. But that does not prevent the Department of Justice from engaging with this committee. Um, and I'm not. Did, did they provide officials to the Department of Health in respect of these regs? Do you know? My understanding is that a DOJ official attended last Thursday's meeting. Yeah. So if, if the Department is able to attend a meeting of the Health Committee to outline these mm -hmm. regs, then it would be good practice and expected that you would have came to this committee, in my view. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we should be putting down a marker in respect of that. So, so do they notify us as a committee that they're going to do that? Because here's the thing, if a committee writes to another committee or to another department, they copy in the committee. I think that's really bad form if there's Justice Department officials attending other committees and we're not aware of it uh, and we don't get feedback from it. I think that's horrendous. I really do. Because what's to stop us as individual Justice uh, Committee members dipping into another committee? And we are aware and have knowledge and been, and been forewarned that that's going to take place. I think that's horrendous. Well, it, it wouldn't be unusual to have held, for example, a joint committee meeting of health and justice, even though it would still be health that would be the primary responsible committee to, to vote through these statutory rules. So you know, that, that's not beyond the realms of possibility for committees to collaborate in that way. I don't know on that particular point. Did, did we get notice that they were going to go to the Health Committee? No, no, we didn't. So, can I just sorry. one last point? I think that we should be try to be balanced in our approach and say that we think that in the future that will be the right approach. I don't want to use the fact that we are, you know, but these are different times and, and people will make mistakes. That's just that's just real life. People yeah. will make mistakes. Um, I'm not sure that there was any intent here, so we just need to be a wee bit cautious. Well, while still making the point. Well, if if we can if we can raise this, I, I'm happy to raise this with the department. You know that in the future, we would expect this committee to be engaged, um, particularly whenever it's the Department of Justice that is, that is leading on an issue around COVID-19 within the executive that the committee would be engaged on it respecting the fact that legally the health committee has to, to deal with regulations that flow but that we should be engaged. I'm also happy to take on Sinead's um, proposal that we would write to the um, First and Deputy First Minister that they should seek to advise all of the ministers 
that irrespective of the Department of Health and the Health Committee being the legally responsible department where they have executive role leading on an issue, that they should then be engaging with their scrutiny standing committee um, on whatever policy area that they're seeking to, to take through. If, if members are agreeable with that, Sinead, I see you want to come in. Yeah, no, Chair, just on that, you know, I think um, I think everybody's pretty much the same. To be fair, this is a process that was set up in haste, and I think it's only now with the outworkings of it starting to reach uh, the chamber level, we can see things that may have been missed. And I don't even know if we need to find out if it's happening across all committees or not, as long as we fix it. Um, so it, I appreciate that, if that could go to the Executive Office. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Members are agreed then with that action point and I'll just reflect the committee position that we didn't um, didn't have any engagement on it and therefore don't have a committee position in terms of the regs and I suspect members may well make their own individual contributions on the debate. Okay. I, Sorry. Um, could I just suggest that if we're writing to the executive committee or the executive office on that basis, we would normally copy it of to course. the executive committee, but you might want to wish to copy it to all the other statutory committees so that they can see what we're asking. Okay. Agreed. Okay. Correspondence. Um, there's five items of correspondence then in, um, in the meeting pack and there's two items at pages 14 to 64 of the table pack and three additional items then were also issued separately by email and provided to members in hard copy. Um, let me just draw out a couple of them. In terms of the meeting pack, item number two was a copy of the response from the Department of Justice bodies um, to, the, sorry, it was a response from the Department and Justice bodies to the findings and recommendations of the Sejini report on how the criminal justice system deals with modern slavery and human trafficking in Northern Ireland. And it's their members um, in order to note that information unless there's any more um, that's required. Okay, well, we, we can ask the Department to update us on the uh, progress of the delivery action plan that's in this document after a six month period if members are agreeable to that. And then table pack um, there was the report of the independent review of hate crime legislation in Northern Ireland by Judge Desmond Marathon. Uh, the report's core finding uh, is that hate crime law in Northern Ireland such as it is is generally ineffective and requires uh, substantial reform including legislative change and the report makes 34 recommendations. So members, if you're agreeable, I think on this one, we could invite Judge Maranen to come to the committee to provide a brief on his report and then members would be able to ask questions. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll seek to facilitate that. Uh, item two on the table pack, there's an invite from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission to the launch of its 2020 annual statement um, on Thursday the 10th of December, which is being introduced by the Speaker the Assembly. Um, okay, members, the committee office can make arrangements for members for anyone that wishes to attend. If you can just advise um, many staff as appropriate. Table correspondence. Um, there's a number of items that obviously has been tabled. Firstly, correspondence from the uh, chairperson of the Northern Ireland Retired um, Police Officers uh, Association. Uh, there's correspondence regarding the identification of police officers by the coroner's office in relation to an inquest, uh, which was touching upon the death of Neil uh, McConville. Um, and that correspondence was received just uh, earlier this afternoon in respect of that issue. Um, I know, Doug, this was an issue, I think, in the correspondence they've included a response from the Minister of Justice. Um, you had raised this issue uh, previously. Um, so if the committee's agreed, um, I would like to get information directly from the Minister on this. Um, obviously, based on my reading of it, whenever information has been released by the coroners, the coronial court system, and if you read the Crown Solicitor's letter in respect of this, this is something that is a major concern um, in terms of a breach of data protection. Uh, I don't know if the coroner's court has contacted the Information Commissioner in respect of this, but certainly the Crown Solicitor's Office response is one that alarmed me. Um, and I would like to, to get uh, more information around this. 
um, including from the Lord Chief Justice, uh, as to his view as to uh, what level of concern there should be attributable to this data protection breach. So I was going to ask the committee that we would write seeking the views of both the Minister and the Lord Chief Justice in respect of this issue. Are members agreed that we would do that? Right. Let me bring in Doug then. Yeah, if I can, Chair, just um, so it's on the record. I, I didn't know that um, that they were going to write to the committee, so um, I was dealing this with this uh, in, a, in, a, in a private capacity as an MLA, um, uh, and I wrote to the minister, and I also met with the police service in regards to the, to this as well. Uh, and the reason why I, I wasn't progressing it any further is, is the sensitive nature of it. Uh, and I hadn't been given permission by any of those individuals who were named to, who, to come forward in case their names got into um, the public domain. So I just want to put on record that I, I, I think it's a really serious matter. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that, that you feel that we need to take this approach, and I'm absolutely supportive uh, with you on that approach as well. We need to do something. I think it's you know, the third time this has happened, um, that it is, it is extremely serious, and I'm I'm, I was was not enthused by the minister's answer to me uh, when when she said that um, uh, in her letter back to me um, that, that that she believed that the incident was 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 contained when there's no evidence that that incident has been contained uh, and that I wasn't I wasn't particularly uh, enamoured by the police's response as well whether they would. Um, conduct an investigation in regards to that. So, uh, I do think there is a, 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 um, a follow-up that we need to, because we've been asked in that letter to do a follow-up to that. But I just wanted to read it in that I did not know that this was coming here until I came in this morning, until I came in this afternoon. Yeah. Well, I, I know the the retired police officers association asked to, to meet with me, and I, I I did speak with them. Um, and when they highlighted to me these issues, it caused me a lot of concern. Um, and I say to them that uh, if you are wanting to pursue this further, then you may want to consider writing to the committee. I did say that in doing that, this then comes into the public domain, uh, hence why it, the correspondence is from, uh, I think it's the chairman of the, the Police Officers Association. Um, uh, and so they were fully cognizant of the fact that in, in writing to this committee, it then becomes public knowledge. Um, but given the the seriousness of the issue. I think that that is an appropriate step that they have taken. Um, the, committee, the committee now, I think, needs to invite a response from the Lord Chief Justice about this issue um, and also the, the Minister for Justice. And when we get those responses, the committee then can consider if there's any further uh, action that it wishes to take on it. So um, thank you for that, members. The other one then is uh, a press release from the Public Prosecution Service uh, regarding the review of the 15 sexual offence cases in which previous convictions had to be set aside after it was identified that a legislative error had caused them to be invalid. Um, again, members will, will wish to note that the PPS has advised that there are three cases in which the test for prosecution is met uh, and for which proceedings will now be brought to the Crown Court. Uh, no fresh proceedings will be brought for the remaining 12 cases as the test for prosecution uh, has not been met. Um, so there's a, a, a letter then from the Department dated the 2nd of December just advising that the Minister is making a statement to the Assembly on an intergovernmental agreement on cooperation on criminal justice matters. Um, and that's just by way of noting for members. Are members content to action then the other items in correspondence as outlined? The cover sheet. Chair, just on that, are, are we assured that um, that you know processes and procedures have been reviewed effectively that will not re reoccur to stop recurrence of this again at any time? Are we assured that that in has terms taken of the, place? The PPS. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. that's. I know we have discussed it before and, and expressed our concerns, but that's that's the important thing, and you know the lessons are learned and action is taken to address. The, the the occurrence and that and things are closed out. The process of procedures are reviewed and, and actions taken to stop recurrence. And that's that's the important thing that lessons are taken from me. And does you know as an MLA we see this so often in, in various government departments. Things reoccur when they shouldn't recur. And, and you know a lesson should be learned. And that's what we we need an assurance that this will not ever reoccur again. 
And it is alarming that you know a number of these cases now have been looked at, which is good. But the three of them, are, the evidence is there that they, they're going to go back to court. But otherwise, this could have they could have slipped through the net. And I think it's important that the issue is closed out effectively. Yeah. Thank you, Gordon. Um, Thanks, Chair. I don't have any chairman. Sorry. 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 Could I just highlight to members that um, we've just received an email from the PPS to say that they've reissued the press release as there was um, a slight um, error in paragraph 6. Um, so we will circulate the revised press release. It basically refers to um, making it clear that only one defendant served a prison sentence as a result of the original proceedings. I think the first version that we got referred to more than one defendant having served a prison sentence, so they've corrected that. Okay. We'll circulate after the meeting. Okay, thank you. I have no chairman's business. Is there any other business? Chair, could I just raise one point? It's only a small matter. Uh, just out of courtesy, uh, the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, I had put in an amendment before the deadline, which wasn't picked up and included on the list. But I understand a notice has gone out to that effect, and it should be with members today. So it will be added to the list. Now, whether it makes it to the Marshall list is another question, but just out of courtesy to let you know that's what it is. Okay, thank you. I did pick I, yeah. I appreciate that because I did pick up the email earlier this morning, so that, that explains it. Um, so thank you for that, Paul. Yeah, just to say I had picked it up and I wondered how you done it, how you had achieved it, Shanera. I wanted to know your no. magic touch. Unfortunately, <laughs> to be for uh, to the bill's office, I had said through that much there was a litany and it did just somehow become lost in amongst it all. Okay, well, the, I know the Marshall list has been emailed out to members, and um, so I'm, I'm scanning through it just as, as we speak, and, and then I could let you know actually if it if it made it or not. Um, but yes, well, listen, that's available for members to to look at in due course. Okay, well then the next meeting of the committee's um, Thursday, the tenth of December, and that'll be at two p.m. in the Senate Chamber. So. Um, we're going to adjourn the meeting. Um, that'll take us very briefly. We're going to have an informal discussion, members, just in terms of committee priorities. Um, but formally, then, the meeting's now adjourned.